All right, we're well, live. Welcome to Revolver Live, the gaming podcast that says forget the past. The future belongs to the nerds. I'm the Beastly Gamer, and today I'm joined by my best friends, co-hosts, cohorts, and co-conspirators, the king of all things Destiny, Briar Rabbit, or as I call him, Briar when I'm cuddling my wife. Briar, Briar Rabbit, how you feeling today, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing awesome, Beastly. How you doing, man? Man, fantastic. Always good. The man who inhales dreams and exhales souls, and I mean that in the best way possible. Wilson, how you feeling today, my friend? I'm doing great, man. How you doing tonight? Great, that was a compliment. And where would we be as a podcast without the smooth <laughs> and sultry sounds of Gary Diaz, the album? And I think we should refer to you as an album from this point on, Gary. You you sound so helpful and post-processed whenever you speak. It's like we could walk into a Borders or a Barnes & Noble and see you standing in the self-help section talking to people. <laughs> How you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well. I'm ready to light up the stage and wax a chump like a candle. So let's Holy go. Holy shit. <laughs> Revolver Live is a gaming podcast, guys, with six revolving topics. Become a part of the show by submitting your topics for suggestion at revolvergamescast at gmail.com. That's revolvergamescast at gmail.com. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. That's twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. The video is also shared on YouTube at Briar Rabbit's channel and my channel, Beastly gamer if you're unable to see the live feed or for some reason you don't like video formats check us out in podcast form on pod uh, podbean itunes or your favorite podcast service and with that behind us welcome to revolver live episode three let's go what's going on fellas easily you fucking killed it you killed Nailed it man it. that intro was fire <laughs> lit, uh, <laughs> lit. that was awesome guys i think we can wrap that's it we can finish the show now we've had we've peaked kill it we have kill peaked. it <laughs> Where the hell is the stop streaming button? <laughs> it's over. It's over. Cut it. Uh, I did want to address that video a little bit that we played at the front. We will be showing that again. We'll put it up on YouTube and stuff. Uh, but that's going to be the only time it's ever shown in the current format. Uh, my wife is making me change that video. <laughs> oh, really? A little bit, of, little bit yeah. of editing and we're A little bit of editing has to go into that video yeah. before it can be <laughs> consumed by the public. But we... We got it out there one time only <laughs> in its original this the, form. This is the first time I'm hearing this about Briar's wife saying, oh, hell no. Yeah. And, you know, and that's that's the secret to a successful marriage. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them and, and stop sucking them, I guess. Good well shit. Said. Well said. You're here, here. We got feedback from last week's episode. Let's go over the feedback from last week's episode. Gary, you want to start that off? Sure do. Sure do. We've uh, had a few emails come in, and I'm going to pick out two of the highlights first one coming from Shane Paulson um, which was actually a little bit of uh, I think it was gloating really is the best way to describe it, he's just rubbing it in that he lives oh, in really? the best part of the world yeah he was talking about digital versus physical games uh -huh. um, and spoke around the benefits of buying digital he lives on the west coast of the US so getting a digital copy not only lets him preload a game like Destiny 2 but he also gets to play it at 9pm pacific time on September the 5th rather than having to wait till midnight on the 6th so I want us all to join together in saying, fuck you, Shane. That's right. <laughs> Very much. That's like oh, saying, you got to uh, rub it in. You know, I know Christmas comes uh, once a year, but we celebrate ours on the 23rd of December. Just wanted to let you know. That's exactly how that feels. Uh, yeah, that is, it is a weird thing. They, Destiny apparently is doing like a staggered rollout this year, though, uh, with Destiny 2. It's, that's the rumor going around anyway, that it's going to launch at midnight in your respective territory. So... Gary could be playing it five hours before we could. He was hoping. Well, to be fair, I'm going to be playing it six weeks after the rest of you because I'm putting an embargo on the console version. But that being said, PC, <laughs> you're definitely right. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'm not playing WoW with you. Oh. Boom, them. Oh. You broke my heart, Wilson. You saw my heart <laughs> break You broke my heart when you said no Destiny 2 on console, man. I, I just said you only had to play it till it comes out on PC, and then you could ditch it. Right. Right, I never reasonable. said I'd stop playing WoW with you at any time. But... Tell him again, Wilson. It's called, you know, it's called being reasonable, Gary. You can't be that much of a fucking elitist. You got friends who... Did you I, see I know, the video we played at the beginning of the show? I was pathetic, okay? You were amazing. I was in the fucking woods crying, and I really feel that way. You know, I hold these things. They're dear to me. And, and everybody doesn't feel this way, Gary, but some of us do. That is a beautiful get, toaster, I gotta and, say. It is. <laughs> Can someone emote that thing and, and, and give it to Beastly for when he gets Twitch partnered? That that needs to be his first yeah, ever. That, that should be. be a emote. sub badge. Look at the state of it. <laughs> you get a, you get I'm a embarrassed toaster. to even be a co-host of it. I mean, it's, it's yeah. 
for the people uh, listening on audio only, he's pulled out his red toaster again three weeks in a row. This is starting to become a. It a doesn't trend. leave my side, Gary. You know, it's like uh, part of my workout regimen. You know, I got these for weight. Nice on my my. What are those? My these are the controllers that go with it. If I want to hook it up to my TV, uh, my wireless Super Nintendo controllers. For I a think, second, I was like, that one's backwards, but it was upside down. Never mind. They're like the color of a knockoff Ferrari. Look how thick they are. Oh, my God. They're like an inch, inch and a half thick. They're as thick as a Super Nintendo controller. Stop no, this. No, that's thicker. Oh, that's like Texas that's Toast thicker. Thick, man. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> Texas Toast Thick. <laughs> oh, that's the theme of the toaster. You know, I mean? <laughs> you know what? They don't have to love you, Yobo. I love you. Look how thick that thing is. It's thick as hell. I mean, it's Look, pretty good. I think if I can just implore the chat and my co-host not to ask questions, it only encourages him. So let's just move on from his toaster and on to our second bit of feedback, which okay. is from <laughs> fan of the show and friend of the show, Super Dan, who's come in strong with a uh, second week in a row uh, and fed back that he'd like us to introduce a question of the week for the comments. So this could be, what do you guys think about the new release? or really what you've been playing, or if you have a specific theme or topic that we want to address and maybe get a bit of feedback in the week that's centered around one topic so we can have a bit of friendly and lively debate, um, that would be a way to carry forward. And I, I frankly love this idea. I think it's, it's really strong. Idea. What do the rest of you think? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a fantastic it's... idea too. Um, and I think that uh, um, Beastly ought to take care of this. I think this has uh, been assigned to Beastly. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> I'll rap. I'll, in, I'll do the intro. Sure. Just Question of the week. Sliding this, I'm just sliding that responsibility. I guess it's in this direction. Down, <laughs> right on over to Beastly. <laughs> Thanks, right. man. So I guess you could also address Beastly's SNES toaster mini as well. If you wanted to, we could put up. Yeah, question, I know question everyone in the world. Everyone in the world can't <laughs> hate this thing. There's got to be someone out there with an ounce of decency in their heart. And understands that things like this are, are beloved treasures to, to console peasants. Well, I, I hear it's coming to shelves next year in Kazakhstan. It's going to be the hottest toy of 2018 over there. But, uh, Kazakhstan? Shit. In the developed world, we've, we've kind of moved on from the, the Chinese knockoffs. Um, we also had an email from Anastasia Bride asking if we wanted hot Russian wives. Um, I, I I frankly do, but I don't know about the rest of the show. Well, my, my wife is from Croatia, so that's really close. Hmm. And uh, they do things, in, you know, over there that they just don't do in America. It's amazing. I can't tell you on a fucking live live Twitch feed. We'll talk about this after the show. <laughs> <laughs> could what could you topic. possibly have to say that we well, haven't me, already discussed this, on this okay? show? <laughs> let, me just, let me just explain this to you. I'll say it real easy. I literally Nut was rolls. just holding the sign up that said I would suck dick for pair of teraflops. <laughs> You sure did. Let me just say this, okay? In Croatia, they make this amazing dessert called nut rolls. They have kind of knockoffs here in the States. They're not just for dessert. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, okay. just think about it. So from, uh, uh, thinking about it. Yeah, one more piece from, of feedback from the YouTube comment section that I wanted to go over today, too. From Michael Olson, he said, I know you guys said that you could play on your TV. So he's, he's talking about the uh, PC's like low-cost PCs we were talking about last year. But to be fair, you play PC games on a PC monitor. And when people say you can buy a PC for $650 and play a 1440p and 144 hertz, then you need a monitor for that. And that's a couple of hundred dollars. Then you need mouse and keyboard. The point is that PC costs way more when you factor in all the extras. I think that's directed towards you, Briar. I think that's in direct response to your, uh, your topic last week. Yeah, of the I low so price too. PCs. What do you got to say to this guy? I mean, he, he's got a point. When I when I talk about a six hundred fifty dollars PC, I talk I'm talking about the PC itself, the accessories. Mo like if you buy a pre built PC, it's going to come with a mouse and keyboard. If you build it yourself, you're going to have to buy the mouse and keyboard separately. Um, but when I do talk about like the lowest cost version of PC gaming, I am expecting that you're going to cobble some stuff together, right? It's like maybe you got a spare monitor or small television hanging around. I feel like everybody's got a spare mouse and keyboard hanging around. And if you don't, maybe your parents like can grab one from work. That's maybe been replaced or something, or maybe you got a buddy who's got, you know, the, an old one. Cause he upgraded his to uh, you know, razor or Corsair or whatever. If you go, if you go out and buy, you know, the top of the line keyboard and mouse, then yeah, those are, 
couple hundred bucks to get them both, right? And if you go out and buy, you know, uh, you know, a 144 hertz monitor, yeah, you're talking about at least a couple hundred bucks. But if you're really like shopping at the bleeding edge or the the lowest edge of the of the price line for computing for for becoming a PC gamer, what you want to spend that money on is the stuff that's going to make the most difference. And the stuff that's going to make the most difference is going in that box. It's mm -hmm. not the mouse. It's not the keyboard. The monitor is something you're going to want to upgrade later, but you can play the games if you have a TV that accepts, accepts an HDMI input, right? So I, I, I definitely I, I am sympathetic to Michael Olson, uh, and I think he brings up a good point here. Uh, and I wanted to clarify what I was talking about, but I, I don't discount his, his uh, conversation here at all. I agree. A, a good solution, too, would be um, check Craigslist um, if you're from the States. Um, there's always a lot of uh, gaming access, uh, PC gaming accessories on Craigslist. And most of the time, like especially monitors, it's people who just want to get rid of them. You know what I mean? It might be a really small one, but I mean, you can get up and running on Craigslist with a mouse, keyboard, and a monitor. I would say for you could take 50 bucks and accomplish that. No problem yeah. on yeah. Craigslist. It won't be top of the line. I would say invest more in your mouse. You know, you could have a crappy keyboard, um, but a good mouse and a good monitor is a good thing to have. I agree. Yeah. And on that subject, um, playing on a laptop, I'm starting to feel like I'm totally not getting the experience I'm supposed to, bro. I, I, I can't wait for this upgrade because I feel like when I'm playing games with you guys, like Briar got, today Briar helped me set up my, my stream. So I'm actually going to be streaming on Twitch. I'm really excited and very thankful that you helped me with that, Briar. I'm really excited but, to watch it. But uh, me playing on a, with this keyboard and this mouse, it felt like something was lost in translation. So I feel like I, I, I really want to upgrade that aspect of my gaming immediately uh, because people buy gaming keyboards and I'm wondering why, because I'm not a PC player. And so it's obvious there's something I'm missing uh, in this experience playing just on a lap laptop keyboard. There's a tactile feel to the gaming keyboards. They're, they resemble most like older keyboards, right? It's like they have mechanical switches that you don't see on new, uh, new keyboards or new laptops. So when you push them in, you can, some of them you can hear an audible click like halfway through the travel and you can mm. feel when it actually actuates um, and then it bottoms out. It's a, it's got much more travel than what you're used to on a laptop or on a you know a modern membrane keyboard. Um, I think a lot of it though to be in all fairness is aesthetics and you know a coolness factor and they're popular right now. <laughs> they're not going to improve your game. Like a gaming keyboard. I'm still going to suck. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's got, you know, maybe it's got some macro keys that help with, you know, certain actions in some games. But like the actual keyboard, like the pressing of the key, I don't think is going to really improve your game over just having a $10 keyboard. Got you. I don't know. Okay. I think I think I'd probably challenge that a little bit in that mm -hmm. I think any mechanical keyboard will improve your game over a membrane. I don't think one particular mechanical keyboard will improve your game more than another, mm -hmm. but definitely there is a a very obvious difference no matter what color switches you've got moving from membrane to um, a, a mechanical switch. Like a membrane keyboard, you've got no feedback when you're pressing the keys. It feels sloppy. There's no real... Um, the, the movement on actuation is is fixed and linear across it. Yeah, I, I can't play on membrane keyboards full stop. So, yeah, I mean, moving on to a gaming keyboard, as long as it's mechanical, you're golden. Uh, there's lots of flavors of mechanical, but, yeah, just always look at a mechanical keyboard. That would be my advice. The mouse, I think there is there is real reason to look into uh, what your preferences are moving forward and how good each sensor is on each mouse. And, you know, you're, you're spending quite a bit on these things, and the quality, apparently, of the sensors... Uh, not only in how good it is at actually tracking, like they have tests where they like move the, they move the mouse in a perfect circle and track the movement on the screen. And it can be wildly different from mouse to mouse what that circle looks like. Um, but also, so not only the quality of the movement, but also the quality of how long it will last is different from mouse to mouse. So that, that's worth doing some research on. Mm. And the monitor, obviously, I mean, it's the monitor is like the wheels on a car or the, the tires on a car is like, the tires on the car are the only point of contact between the car and the road, and they make a huge difference to the car's performance. But Absolutely, yeah. The monitor is your only input. You know, your your eyes 
it's like your only feedback from what the game is actually doing. So the better your monitor, obviously, the the better experience you'll have. All right. Well, are we going to move on to our revolving topics, gentlemen? Yeah, we got six topics. We're going to bang them out. Pow, pow, pow. And don't forget, pow, you guys can be a part pow. of the show by submitting your topics for consideration at revolvergamescast at gmail.com. First topic is for me. Uh, sometimes I sit around my house and I'm looking at my consoles and my, sorry, Gary, consoles, and I'm thinking about, you know, the experiences I've had with them, whether or not they're going to last, how long it'll be until they, they sit on the shelf. And I found myself spending time looking at my Nintendo Switch. It's something that I honestly haven't played a lot of. I think I may have bought three games on it since its release, and I got it, you know, right at release. And here's my thoughts on it. My thoughts on the Nintendo Switch so far. The Switch has been out for quite a few months now, and if sales are any indication, it's a huge success. While I enjoy the console for what it has done for me in bridging the gap between portable and console quality games, I have found that as of late, I've expressed less interest in this console. There have been a few notable games, in my opinion, uh, or games that suit my taste as a gamer. Uh, games like Skyrim, Mario Odyssey are games that excite me, and until they release, it seems we have to contend with Neo Geo ports and mostly indie offerings. My question to you is, have you guys continually played your Switch consoles, or have they taken a back te- backseat to other consoles and games at this point? And what do you think of the future for the console? I think it's pretty obvious for me that it's taking a backseat. I still have yet to pick one up. We, me and Sam have been talking about it, that we want to get one because we en- enjoy Zelda games, obviously, and then the two of us playing Mario Kart together. I enjoy it until she gets to the point to where she starts kicking my ass at Mario Kart, and then that's usually when I leave Mario Kart. It's inevitable. Happens. First time we hung out ever, I think we played we played Mario Kart 64. So she beat you it, oh, man. Built she'll, on, she'll claim wow. she did, but... You ain't gonna let her claim it. No. Hey man, that, that's a that's a hell of a foundation, Wilson. I didn't know you know any anything about the way you guys started out, but that's a that's an awesome foundation, brother. That's that's real love there. Great. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. So like, definitely want to get Mario Kart, Zelda, um, Skyrim. I think I've bought on every single platform. Me I too. think I'll probably skip it on this one, depending unless it goes on sale or something. But yeah, I still have yet to pick one up. So there I'm interested to see what you guys. Skyrim? Say what, uh, Brian? No, yeah. I haven't seen one. It might be, but you know, I, I haven't followed it that closely at this point. But but what do you guys think of your switches? Um, have have they been active in your in your games library recently? Have they have they kind of taken a backseat, Brian or Gary? What what are your thoughts? Uh, for me, it's become very much my travel console. Uh, when I you know when I'm getting on a plane or I'm getting going for a long trip, uh, it's the thing that I throw in the bag. Uh, I still have more Zelda to play, which excites me. Uh, I also downloaded that forty-dollar version of Street Fighter Two. Are you fucking kidding oh, me fuck with that, that price? But I, I mean, I'm a, I am a Street Fighter Two fanatic. Like, I love Street Fighter Two. I could just play it forever, uh, and I will probably. <laughs> I have it. I have it on. You know, like every console that I can play it on, uh, and having a pretty damn good version of it on the Switch. Is great. It doesn't control awesome because of the the analog stick. Like you have to use an analog stick on the left hand side, but it's not bad. Um, and it's fun enough to play on a plane and stuff like that. I also have Snake Pass, which I I think is a pretty relaxing uh, game to play in bed. So I've actually my switch has gone from my office to my bedside table. That's where mine is. I'll I'll just like kind of lean over, grab it, and play a couple of, uh, levels of Snake Pass, like. You know, just to relax a little bit. Not even at night. Like, sometimes I'll just be, like, waiting for a, re- a video to render. I'll wander in there. I'll just lay down on the bed and start playing a little bit of Snake Pass because I know I got, like, 30 minutes to kill while I'm waiting for a video to render. You know, I'll s- I-, I like my Switch. I'm excited for the future of Switch. Uh, Splatoon isn't my game, so I didn't go after Splatoon. Um, Mario Kart, again, not my game. It used to be, but, like, I've kind of fallen. You know, I played Same a lot here. of Mario Kart back in the day, and, you know, it's not exciting to me anymore. The new Mario game I'm really looking forward to. But what I'm really most looking forward to is seeing what kind of uh, indie games and smaller games and uh, you know virtual console type games start coming. When they when they start releasing like Mario Super Mario Brothers and you know Mario 3D and Metroids and stuff like that. Oh like, man. I'm really excited for that. And actually there's a Metroid game coming out for 3DS that's not too far away. I'm pulling out my 3DS for that one because I just like that. 
I like those old school kind of 2D games every once in a while, and they're perfect for maybe I'm watching some TV. Maybe I'm not wholly invested in what I'm watching, so I just, I'll just kind of lean over and grab the, you know, a Switch or a 3DS or a Vita. Vita and, you know, <laughs> That's start, what it's called now. And start playing on a small console like that. So I, I see exactly where you're coming from, Brian. And, and a part of that I agree with. I. I took my Switch as my travel console when I went on vacation last month. Uh, unfortunately for me, I also took my PS4 and PSVR because my family had no, of North had never seen it. Yeah. And VR kind of took the spotlight everywhere we went. Everybody was in line to play it. I yeah. got video of my own mother standing up and falling over to the floor. One of the greatest videos I've ever recorded. I made sure she didn't break a hip. But yeah, she stood up and she thought she was inside this aquarium, fell over, smashed the floor. It kind of took the limelight away from what the switch was because people had never seen this new technology. Every now and then, my wife and I will will get into some snipper clips, but it's like one of those conundrums. Like we'll go get in bed and we'll start watching YouTube or we'll start doing something else. Hit hit, and and uh, the switch will just sit there. So I'm actually like you. Mario Odyssey is something that's really big for me. I really enjoy one of my favorite portable games I've ever played was Resident Evil Revelations 1 on the 3DS. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, I think it was, was it Claire Redfield? It wasn't Claire. It, one of the p- pivotal characters from the past, I forget her name. Uh, she was on this giant ship and it, it took it back to the Resident Evil 1 roots and it was on the 3DS and it was one of the best experiences I ever had. That's coming to the Nintendo Switch. New announcement. Revelations 1 and 2 as a singular product are going to the Switch. To me, that's the perfect game. It's a remaster, something like that, coming to the Switch. Games like Skyrim that I've never been able to take on the go, that's what really excites me about this console. But as of right now, I got what I believe is the best game on the console, and that gives the console, to me, a ton of life. Like you haven't beat the game, there's still a ton to do in it. But I was just wondering how you felt about it. Now, Gary, I haven't, you've been silent. I know it's a console, but tell I'm me how you feel. In, so I've got a very, very different perspective to all of you on the um, the Switch. So I'm a I'm a big handheld guy. Um, you you might might have heard I like the Vita. Um, so for me, handheld gaming is something and portable gaming is something that I hold dear and something that I really enjoy. I like the style of game that you get. I like the fact they're not trying to be a graphical powerhouse. They generally have playability in other areas and you find value in other areas. So for me, predominantly would describe myself as a PC gamer. That that's what I play my things on. So for me, the Switch is a very, very different proposition in that I don't, if a game's multi-platform, you know, you're talking about Skyrim, I'm never going to play it on the Switch. I'm going to play it on the PC. Um, If a game is things like Call of Duty, again, whilst no one really plays on the PC, that would be where I'd choose to play it. For me, if it's multi-platform, I will play it on PC. I don't care what the PlayStation or Xbox does. The Switch presents a really unique um, proposition because there's games that just wouldn't work on the PC, really work on the Switch. So for me, it's my it's easily my primary console of choice, more so than the PlayStation 4, because I have almost no reason to play a PS4 outside an exclusive or yeah. playing alongside you guys, because I've got a better proposition. But there's nothing that can compete with the Switch. So Zelda, love it. I've played it to death, and I'm saving the master mode for my vacation. So I will be playing it abroad. My fiance has put about 250 hours into Splatoon 2 so far. What? Uh, yeah, she's like closet splatfest queen. She's uh, she's a she's a ketchup queen is, at the moment. That game is dope, Beastly. Wow. If you haven't checked it out, you should check it out because if you haven't tried it yet, that game is very I, good. I haven't, I haven't. Our friend Inner Black Ninja is a huge fan of Splatoon. I don't know if he's playing part two or not, but uh, when part one came out, I never got a hold of it. I was trying to move on, you know, to more powerful consoles or whatnot. And when this one was re- revealed, I was like, well, it looks like the Wii, the just a Wii U game, but. Everybody who's playing it is telling me it's amazing. You said 250 hours, Gary? Yeah, she's really absolutely destroyed it. She's been on her vacation. She's a teacher. Uh, She's head of department in a secondary school. And she's had this whole vacation. And she planned to play all these different games and watch all these different animes. And she's just been on Splatoon 2 constantly, endlessly. Uh, I've been watching it and peeping it. But obviously, I can't prize the, um, the... switch out of her dead cold hands um, she's just <laughs> clinging to that <laughs> have to get another one oh, well, shit. i find myself asking her, or at least i don't know if you guys have this as well where i'll find a game or i'll play a game on pc or play a game somewhere else or i see a game advertised for the playstation and i think oh my god wouldn't that be good on switch like i've said that so many times like this game would be amazing on switch 
and I'd never say that about any other console. It's the, I guess I kind of said it about Vita on certain things, but for me, the, the portable aspect of the Switch and the fact that it, it is that hybrid console and it does things that the other consoles can't and satisfies the niche that I don't have on PC, I think it's the primary console that a PC gamer should buy. I'd recommend it over a PlayStation 4 in any day of the week. Wow. Assuming you're I mean, a PC that's, gamer. That's crazy talk to me because there's just not enough software for it. Like... I understand your point about like you know a lot of the games that come to PlayStation Four are you know they're better on the PC if you have a PC, um, but there's so many exclusives coming to PS Four that looks so good that I'd much rather have a PS Four than a Switch if I'm a you know if I'm a hardcore gamer. Switch is great because it's portable, but the PS Four has really good exclusives and they got they got a bunch that are already out that you can go and play like right off right off the bat. But then they got a bunch coming out like this year that look Yeah. Great. A lot of the exclusives, though, I feel like you're playing them because they're exclusive. I've probably played three PS4 exclusives or Sony exclusives myself, and I'd consider myself a gamer. Maybe I'm a niche gamer and I'm pigeonholed, but I played Horizon because of how hype it was. Not, I didn't really have that much interest in playing Horizon. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a great game. But I wouldn't really be much worse off if I hadn't played it. If I'm honest with you, I've got Uncharted. I've never played any Uncharted game. Um, really? I've got all of them. Yeah, I've got all of them. I've Man, never you're played missing them. out, bro. Um, I tried to play Bloodborne. Couldn't do it. Oh, um, what? Neo seemed okay. Dark Souls I played on PC. I don't know. For me, the, the exclusives... Um, the Last of Us, if, please? Uh, yeah, no, actually, that's true. That's one of my three. So The Last of Us and um, Horizon, I think, were the, the two big ones that I played. And there's, I think there's a third, but I'm, I'm forgetting I mean, it now. I mean, you listed off some games that are... Really, like, Amazing. really close to my heart. You know, the Uncharted series. I was a little bit disappointed with Uncharted Four. I know that's not an unpo- uh, that's not a popular opinion, but Uncharted Two and Three are some of my favorite games of all time. Like, I thought they were just outstanding. Like, they. I've never played a game that made me feel like an action star more than yeah. those two games. Yeah, and Uncharted Four. It was more of that, and I, mean, I guess I was a little disappointed because they didn't evolve it any. But I mean, it was still a great game. Uh, Horizon, I thought was, I thought it was pretty spectacular. Um, it didn't hold my attention just because Zelda came out like a week later. You did so, it wrong, bro. You did it wrong. What do you mean? <laughs> you went straight to that Zelda. Everybody who played Zelda turned it back on Horizon. It was just a better well, overall was, package. Yeah, it was just a better overall package, but it was still a mm-hmm. fantastic game. And the story, I thought was, I mainlined the story. I didn't get down with the the side quests at all. I really like they just couldn't hold my attention. But the and that might have been because I was a rush in a rush to get through it. You know, I just wasn't given the side quest a chance. But I thought the story was fantastic and the combat was fun. Like it was just fun. Um, I mean, the God of War, like, the new God of War looks dope as shit. Like it really is exciting. War, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's Dad of War. It looks Ooh. really good. Like you talk it, about it, the Uncharted series, and that was one of the first games that I ever played that I felt like I was watching a movie. Mm-hmm. Like I not. Yeah only wanted to play because the gameplay felt good but i wanted to get to the next cutscene and find out what happened like i was totally immersed into it didn't haven't played the newest one still i think that charm sort of burned out on me but i feel like that was one thing that uh naughty dogs does really well with that series is tell a story that is that keeps you interested and in fast fast yeah yeah it's not like yeah it's not like we got these long cut scenes where you're talking to a box in the top right hand corner that's barely moving and you don't care about what they're saying. These these stories move fast. They got character development. You love all the characters. Like they, yep. they're fast. Yep. I mean, it could just say more to my taste as a gamer though, because for me, story has always been of little importance to me. Like you're talking to a guy who put eleven thousand hours into just a grind, a, a game where I'm just playing and, and grinding through without any need for narrative. Um, so maybe that's why those particular games didn't appeal to me and why the, the Sony exclusives aren't, I'm not their demographic. So that could potentially could be. be the reason for it. Uh, and I, well I, 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 just quickly, I want to address one game that you couldn't get into. Bloodborne. Please take it back. Bloodborne was so good. My God, it was an Bloodborne amazing game. Bloodborne was fantastic, but I hear Gary on that frame rate. I remember playing that, and there was like this bridge. It wasn't even like a big bridge. It was like this little 10-foot long bridge. And I think the the frame rate drops to like 10 frames per second on that bridge, man. And you're expected <laughs> to fight did. on it. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, and I like that game, but whew, that frame rate is rough. 
<laughs> that was spot you're talking about. I saw a speedrunner get stuck there because of the frame rate. It like was just, oh, that yeah. bridge was awful. Ooh, that pissed me off if I was a speedrunner. Oh, yeah. I've, I've every, never liked every... the Dark Souls game, and Dark Souls 3 on the PC was the first one I've played and completed because I really enjoy playing it at 144 frames a second. You know, I, I just I found the fluidity of the combat easier to manage. I found I was dodging easier, playing easier. If I could get Bloodborne on PC, I would play it tomorrow. That's you know how much I want to play the game, but I just can't. But but there are also exclusives on the PS4 that you can't really. It's not just because they're exclusive in title. Uh, games like uh, Until Dawn or something that you just don't really see anywhere else. Games that come out of nowhere, no one expects, and are really kind of game-changing experiences where you're watching and experiencing like this cinematic gaming experience that tells an incredible story and makes you feel like you're a part of it. Uh, other games like Ratchet and Clank, which I just recently bought, are amazing PlayStation exclusives. Oh, you, you get can't the really new one? Yeah, I bought it, it on sale. It's like a, it's, it's the remake of the first one. Yeah, Briar, I swear to you, man, it looks like you're playing um, like a Disney or Pixar film. Mm. I'm playing it on the pro. I actually went full 4K, not capturing any footage, and I played it on my 4K with HDR. My brain exploded. My eyes just melted out of my head. It looks like you're playing a real Pixar film. That's how it looks. It's insane. I've always liked the Ratchet and Clank. And it's been. completely it's a complete remake. Everything you love from the original series all those years ago, just revamped and redone, and it just my it's eye shatteringly beautiful. And it's just something you, you really can't get anywhere else. Yeah, I and saw some, Sam playing it. She picked it up, and it looks like it runs very very smooth. And so, she's not even she's not even playing it on a pro, and it just looks fantastic. She really enjoyed it. So I think if you really like Ratchet and Clank, you should pick it up. They, they have good games. Up. They're solid games. They got fun weapons to play with. They get fun worlds to explore. They get they got fun and interesting characters. Like I'm down. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I all your sorry points. Took over this no, no, I take I take all your points on it. I mean, mine. It's just expressing myself. I've I've got all the consoles, so I, it's not like I'm limited in what I can play. I've got a PlayStation 4 Pro sitting on my desk here, ready to go on a 4K monitor, and I haven't turned it on. You just can't months. tear tear yourself away from WoW. That's the problem. Yeah, no, I'm, it's PC in general. I I have played the Switch. I haven't played the PlayStation. I played the Vita more than I have played my PlayStation Four. But that again, it's me. I'm probably seeing it from my perspective. So I appreciate you guys have made very persuasive points. So I am uh, I'm willing to be open minded about it. <gasps> oh, this is that amazing. was that was a really in depth Switch discussion there. <laughs> where did scary. that one go where did that one go <laughs> well that's the beauty of, of revolver podcast right it, it revolved and evolved into another conversation briar interjected the fact that there are exclusives on other consoles and it kind of went haywire but that's what we love and that's what the people who watch revolver love about the podcast next topic let's revolve guys nice well next topic uh is a topic that i picked and it's purchasing collector's edition games for the swag or the items that you get. So lots of games these days are selling collector's edition bundles that come with in-game content or in like real life items. So whether that be weapons, quests, cosmetic items, or even future DLC, or uh, whether that be a handbag or a collector's edition ghost or underwear. Yeah. Underwear, you know, but I guess like, you know, what I kind of wanted to talk about was, how many times have you guys upgraded to the higher price bundle based upon what you will receive? And what are some of the most memorable and funny collector's edition bundles that you can remember? I got two right on the tip of my tongue, so I'll go first. The Halo <laughs> mass, uh, the Halo helmet was a big one. The cat helmet it was like a little miniature. Yeah, is there one behind you? I can't see it. I've but... got. You can't see it. I got it back there somewhere, though. I need to organize my room. It's a disaster. That... That was dope. I'm not going to lie. I still like that thing. I like having that thing around. I was a huge Halo fan. Uh, and it's even though I don't play Halo anymore, I still I still like crack a smile when I see that helmet. Um, the other one is my Destiny Ghost from the Collector's Edition. It's so good. I, like it is. To me, it's one of the coolest uh, Collector's Editions I've ever gotten. Um, it's a light up ghost. You know, it's USB powered. It's got a battery in it. Like, it's just a cool thing. Um, I will say the Bioshock figurine was pretty good too. I have that. Yeah. That came broken. I was one of the people when that when that came out. Half of them were broken. That got shipped out. So you, they oh. started a program where you could ship them back and get a new one. I got one of the replacements from that. 
That's Jack. I, I honestly, guys, haven't been one of the one of the, the, the gamers who's purchased many of these collectible um I guess collectible sets. Uh I never do it when it's digital content only because in my mind that digital content will become available somewhere down the line either way. But some of the more memorable ones that I've seen in the past that I actually considered doing, I'll only do it first of all if it's a game I'm head over heels in love with, like The Last of Us. The Last of Us 2 comes out with a bust of a character or something. I'm buying it. But the craziest one I ever saw had to be Dead Island. They, they came out with um, a collector's edition, which was a woman's torso yeah. missing a head. And it was just bit the fuck up. It was a huge torso about this big. And it was a zombie torso with no head. And I was like, wow, it looks cool. But it, it's not really something you would just show off in your living room or on the mantle. Right. <laughs> and But it was really cool. And it really fit the, the, the uh, you know, what the game was all about, the feel of the game. So to me, that was awesome. And another one that I remember from the past years ago was on uh, the GameCube when uh, Resident Evil 4 came out. They did a special edition where you could buy Resident Evil 4 and you got a GameCube controller that was shaped like the the chainsaw that's used in the actual game. Uh, I remember that. I yeah. remember that too. And to me, that was something, you know, I was younger and I didn't really dabble with things like that. I wasn't at GameStop or Funko Land every day. But that stands out to me as some of the most memorable and awesome kind of kit that you could buy with, with, uh, with game collector's editions. What do you think, Gary? So I've got a few, actually. I'm... <laughs> Again, I I waste more money than any human should ever waste on games. Send some, send some to me. I'll give you my address after the show. It's <laughs> ridiculous amounts. I I find it difficult if someone shows me that there's a collector's edition of a game that comes with something physical to not just buy that edition default. So almost every game that I buy is the collector's variant or the limited edition or the whatever else there. Um, so I've got a lot to choose from potentially there some of the the more odd ones um i was a bit of a g in my youth you know running with you the crypts and the are, bloods Gary. so um are they over there they've made their way across no i the... think i'm it's it's more of a, a spiritual link that i feel across the oh, pond okay you know? gotcha gotcha I'm, I'm crip walking all the way down to to <laughs> london um no i had i don't know if you ever played on the PlayStation 1, there was a, a Wu-Tang beat-em-up, four-way beat-em-up called Shaolin that. Style. Yeah, I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. With um, all the characters were like reimagined. So you had like Yu God with the golden arms and like, you know, like Rizzo with the swords. And it was it was amazing. Great game. Really good fun. And I actually got the collector's edition of that, which came with a PlayStation 1 controller, which was a finger torture device. But it was the Wu-Tang shaped PS1 controller with like a W, like the Wu W. What? It was the best no. controller I've ever seen. I remember um, that. It was black Completely and yellow, right? Black, yeah, yellow buttons, black Wu Tangs. So it would be like, so you know, you could do that. There, <laughs> the stuff. It was Damn! <laughs> liquids, uh, you know, popping liquid swords. That was the controller that I always had when you know buddies came over, just because again it was swag. Um, wow. So that was probably the weirdest thing I bought. Uh, I don't know, man. I've seen you with something weirder. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> now uh, for the for that controller. That, <laughs> For the people that aren't uh, long-term watchers of the show, if you're new to the show, um, I actually picked something up for my PlayStation Vita, a collector's edition for a game called Galgun, a double piece. Uh, I don't have it to hand here, but the premise of the game is that you photograph. It's a school, effectively, and you're, you're photographing um, young, impressionable Japanese schoolgirls. Um, and certain and precarious angles, situation, Jeff. Certain, <laughs> certain angles can get can get slightly more points for the photos and that collector's edition came with um, it's called the pedophilia call the game <laughs> yes <laughs> the game came with uh, what was classed as a screen cleaner um but it's actually a pair of japanese girls school panties um which i'm not too proud to say that i've got on display somewhere <laughs> in my house i thought you were gonna say you were wearing them i was about to be like yes i, I have them on <laughs> Right now, and then the other practical um, collector's edition that I've got that I get use of every day, well, not every day, but when it's in the winter time, is Infamous Second Son. Um, I got an edition that came with a beanie hat, oh. and I still use that beanie hat to this day because it's a, a, a fashionable, functional piece of clothing. <laughs> so that's, that's another uh, PlayStation exclusive, Gary. You brought it back. Awesome. I've never played the game. Um, I just, you just want that beanie. Oh fuck! You swag. Yeah, yeah no, I've got loads. I could I could mention endless of them. I'm looking up now. I bought like it was like a two hundred and fifty dollar version of Final Fantasy twelve that we bought recently. Final Fantasy fifteen that came with the the um the Noctis figure. 
Um, every one you can think of that's come with something cool, we've we've probably bought. So, uh, Gary, I will say just, this. Oh. Go ahead, Beast. No, no, just go ahead. This is nonsense. Go ahead. I, I will say this is that over the years, um, I've become more resistant to buying this stuff um, yeah. because I do find that so so little of it actually like means anything to me after I've put down the game. Right? It's like it's got to be a really special game to me. Actually, means something, and that's why like the three I listed, they were cool pieces of swag, but they also when I look at them, they remind me of that experience of playing that game. And so few games do that to me. I did order, I went ahead and ordered the collector's edition or the whatever edition of destiny two. Yeah. And I look at that stuff and I'm like, ah, you know, it's a bag. It's not nearly as cool as that ghost. Yeah. Right? That it's ghost not is nearly awesome. as cool. Um, but I got it. I'll probably give it away because I don't really want this shit around. Right. I don't, <laughs> I don't actually want to have these little trinkets all around my house like it's it's not that i'm embarrassed that i'm a gamer it's just that i don't like shit around like i don't like clutter and i don't like yeah you know i don't like having this spare stuff around that's functionally useless so <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's like, i'm the, I'm the exact cool. opposite i uh i think a lot of it stems from like i mean if it's in-game stuff and it's a game that i really like and enjoy like yeah. destiny no no brainer i'm getting it i'm doing yeah. it if i'm gonna put the amount of hours that i'm planning on putting into destiny 2 why not you know i'll yeah. be really able to enjoy that stuff uh i was the same way i got the the halo helmet the master chief helmet but probably one of the most memorable ones for me was the call of duty night vision goggles oh you guys yeah remember that yeah i had those and they were they were great for Flipping they were switching functional. the house and walking around. They worked pretty good. They worked even yeah. better during the wintertime when there was snow on the ground and there was more oh. light being able to be reflected. Amazing. Uh, but as far as... Uh, I, I used to be a sucker for it. Collector's edition, everything. Collector's edition, everything. And then I had to move for the first time. <laughs> and then you realize how much stuff you have during a move. And then when you <laughs> unpack how much stuff you have to unpack... And having all these figures and stuff. It's the same thing. I'm not embarrassed that I'm a gamer. I mean, all of my tattoos, I wear it very proudly that I'm a gamer. You know what I mean? And But having all these figures to pick up and dust. Like, I'm not big on dusting as much as I probably should be. Sorry, Gary. But uh, <laughs> you probably keep your place Man, tidy. I'm, I'm but, just um, so bad for it. I've got <laughs> games that I have no intention of ever playing. Like Far Cry 3. Which is the one with Pagan Min? Is that three? I've four. never played that game. I think that's four. Is it four? Okay, four. I've got the statue of him sitting in front of an elephant above me. I've never <laughs> put the disc in the drive or played the game. Um, just literally things game. like that just sit around. Hitman, you know, the one that you like, Briar. I've rebought that on PC with the intention of playing it, but when it came out on the PlayStation, it came with a nice suit tie and the guy sitting on a chair. So I bought that. Uh, I've never played it. It's just Listen, things like that. That, I've that game bought. is phenomenal, Gary. Like, it's yeah. really fun. It's... It's a really good streamer game too. Like if you're looking to like stream a game and you want some good chat interaction, like the the chat really gets into what you're doing because there's an investment to what kind of hijinks you're up to. It's a great game. I might try that, bro. I think I think a lot of the the need for when I first started getting collector's edition everything was because growing up in our day, we didn't really have as much access to um trinkets and swag and stuff yep. like that because the internet was still very very young back in my day to get official nintendo swag you had to save up powerpoints of the back of your <laughs> nintendo power magazine and yep. once you got like a billion of them you know i remember getting sent it in for the uh the james bond the nintendo 64 golden eye uh it was a replica of his watch and uh, I had, like, the watch replica. There was just so much cool stuff that you could get from it. And I think, like, as once I got a little older and more, like, collector's edition stuff started popping up and I had more disposable income, it was a bit of a splurge because I didn't wasn't really have that much access to it as a kid. You weren't and restricted then, anymore, yeah. Yeah, and then, like I said, once you move for the first time, you're like, <laughs> I don't want to keep taking well, all this stuff with me. have gotten so fucking expensive. Like, the... The Fallout 4 one, I was into. Like, the one that came with that, like, bomb. Like, the, the Megaton bomb. Like oh, it, yeah. It was like a mini nuke. There. I was like, yeah, <laughs> man. That actually looks cool. I wouldn't mind having that little me that little mini nuke around. Uh, you know, maybe I could even do something fun with it. 
oh, it's $250. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> what about the bread? Didn't you want the refrigerator too? Uh huh. Yeah. Tiny mini fridge. Yeah, I thought that would have been cool. I could actually use a mini fridge in my office. It'd be convenient to have cold drinks ready to go all the time. Yeah. But it's like, I don't really like, you know, I have a family, I have responsibilities, right? Well, so, I think kids ain't cheap, man. Anytime I spend money, I'm always thinking, what is the return on investment of this money? Mm-hmm. Right? Um, it's easy for Destiny. You know, I could, I could spend, I could easily spend an, you know, a bunch of money on Destiny stuff because there's a very easy return on investment for me. For entertainment stuff, it gets a little harder. You know, yes, there's a return on investment because I am getting entertainment value. Yeah. I am getting entertainment value out of it. But, like, if I'm going to buy, like, a $200 version of a game and I'm going to get some trinket that sits on a shelf and does absolutely fucking nothing for me, especially if I end up not loving the game like Fallout 4... (laughs) <laughs> wait a minute. This doesn't do, this doesn't do nothing, bro. It's a reverse wait, wait, wait. investment. Oh, shit. That's the real It makes sound. noises. It, yeah. it does so much more. That's what the ghost so does. Well, more. this whole conversation, I, I get two things out of it. Hashtag Briar was right. Uh, I think it was last show. Uh, Wilson said, you know, the whole purpose of life is to fill your house with all this shit. And Briar said, no, it's to figure out how to get this shit out of your house. And so <laughs> that's exactly the truth. And another thing I'll say to you guys, I do have some trinkets, right? But I've taken it a step further, and I think in a more meaningful way. Certain games that I've, I've grown to love over the years, Tekken is one of my favorite fighting games, if not my favorite. My favorite character in that game, her name is Nina. I named my kid Nina, okay? I named her Nina because of Tekken, and my wife knew it before we named her. I also named my last kid, Ellie, from my favorite game of all time, The Last of Us. So I guess it's kind of a return on an investment. You don't have to spend any money or put any extra space aside. Just name your fucking kid after the Did game you, you like. you just say you don't have to spend any money on kids? Because that's the most expensive thing I've ever undertaken. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, all I do is make money, and I, I don't see it anyway. So to me, I'm just living life. <laughs> right. Shit, I'm just living it. I'm stuck. You know, it is what it is. I'll be back at work tomorrow. I promise you that. It's actually a pretty good transition into our next topic, which is the grind. Um, I threw this one in. <laughs> Why do we enjoy the grind in gaming, but we don't enjoy the grind in anything else? So you said, you know, you're sitting there, you're grinding at your desk, you're grinding at work, come home, hit the sheets, you're grinding again, but that's probably yeah. a little bit more enjoyable. Um, you know, it's the grind as a game. It, we as gamers have come to enjoy the grind. I've heard Destiny 2 lamented for having less of a grind. People saying, oh, it's not going to have the grind. What are we going to grind? Where's the grind? When did the grind become fun? When they figured out how to reward us for it. That's when it became fun. When they figured out how to get that dopamine trip on us. You know, like, what we'll do is we'll we'll, we'll make them do 15 minutes of bullshit work, but at the end of it, we're going to give them this purple shiny thing, and he's going to smile about it, and he's going to be looking for the next 15 minutes of bullshit work to do. 100%. 100%. You know, they, they've found a way to get you to the, the, the last, I guess it would be the, the flagpole at the end of every Mario level, but they've stretched it out and gave you something at the other side of that flagpole. And games like Destiny, get, MMOs are notorious for it, giving you something. You know, you're working out there hard for, for some kind of rare drop, and you finally get it. It might have taken you hours. For you, Gary, hundreds of thousands of hours, you're still there for a reason because you're getting something. <laughs> And, and, and Briar nailed it. For me, as a console gamer, I've, I've dabbled in MMOs. I've played Silk Road. I probably put over three or 4,000 hours into that game years ago. Uh, and the thing that kept me coming back was the prospect of finding something so rare that even in the game world, in the real world, it would cost someone $50. You know, that special loot, that special item that just you might chance, uh, you know, by chance come across. And Destiny has that in spades. I think there's no other game quite like that. Other games have tried the formula, but I don't think any other game has really mastered it the way Destiny has. I feel like grind is a good thing to, although some will call it artificial longevity added to a game, um, there's a lot of people out there that that is how they like to play the games. You know what I mean? Like grinding for a specific item. And it's also a bit, I feel like, throw the word elitist around a lot but it's it is it's 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 something to be like hey i got this first and then yeah. now your friends want it and you could take them and show them where you got it and mm-hmm. stuff like that and it it's 
a very cool feeling when you get the drop you're looking for when it drops. It's a sigh of relief. But just like Briar said, you're on to the next 15 minutes of bullshit for the next one as soon as you get what you want. And like, I feel like a lot of people get turned off by that like artificial longevity, but I don't really have a problem with it. Like that was my big concern when they said that weapons were going to have stagnant roles in Destiny 2 was my first thought was, well, what about the grind? What about, where's the grind? What am I going to, you know, I'm going to be really upset by the time I get four or five of, you know, a certain hand cannon when I'm after a certain type of pulse rifle or auto rifle or something. So um, I, I really enjoy it. And for me personally, it's not even if you don't get what you want. I mean, there was the grasp of Malak is a perfect example. Me and Briar, dude, how many hours did we grind that out on stream? Just kicking back beers and hanging out and having a good time, and that was one of the most. The end of that fun was real hazy. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Bri Briar's limit is five, and that's when his wife takes one of them. How far did you guys get here? We we Coach were you? we did it the whole stream, just just killed her over and over and over again, and it was one of my favorite nights because we were hanging out, we were shooting the shit. Eventually, you get turned into autopilot mode on what to do, and it becomes less about. The adventure has going to sound cheesy, less about the adventure itself and more of the destination and where you guys end up afterwards. Like, you know, it's a great night. We all got what we were looking for. Or, hey, you know, maybe tomorrow night we'll get it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, there's a bit of magic to it. To me, it feels like your time is valuable, you know, um, and I think everyone values their own time. There are games out there you could play, you know, a, a, kick, a quick five or ten minute mission, and it's the same thing over and over again. But when, when developers have found a way to stretch out your time in a meaningful way like this, it becomes a more valuable experience. You know, if you're playing for 30 or 40 minutes towards a goal and you know at the end of the goal, there's a big question mark, but more than likely there's something there that's going to be unique, that's going to add to your experience. It makes that time, that investment, more important and more valuable to the gamer. And I think, I mean, I'll use that example again. Destiny has really, really mastered that experience. It, you don't feel like you're wasting your time. It's it's a more meaningful experience because, of course, your time is valuable to you. You're going to put in those hours. You're putting them in for a reason because it is a meaningful experience because of, I guess, you know, that, that light at the end of the tunnel, that that pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. And so I think it's that's a fine line, though, isn't it? Basically, like some games have a grind in them, but it just feels tedious and and awful. You, you know, mm -hmm. there's yeah. a reward waiting for you at the end of the grind. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. But. Even That's when why I'm citing like, Destiny. I mean, there's been... I remember that... This is a way back when, but a co-worker of mine said, you got to check out EverQuest. you got to check out EverQuest. you got to check out EverQuest. I, I downloaded it. I paid the $15 monthly fee to get into it. So it was like... It ended up... I can't remember, but it was, it was a lot of money at the time to just play for the night. So I get in there, and he's teaching me what to do. And one of the first thing he says to me is, okay, you got to learn this skill now. I'm like, okay, how do I do that? He's like, you got to meditate. I'm like, how do I meditate? He's like, you got to click this button and then sit there still. I'm like, how long do I got to sit here for? He's like, 15 minutes. I'm like, are you fucking shit me? Like, is this a game or is this <laughs> <laughs> like, I got to sit here. simulator. I got to, I got to literally sit here still for 15 minutes. He's like, yeah, that's how you do it. I'm like, I'm fucking out. <laughs> like, this, this is not, this is not for me. This, I'm, you know, it was pissing me off because I bought the game and then I paid that $15 and I was young. I didn't have a lot of money. You know, like that was a lot was of money. Right there that, was, you, that was another, that was a game I could have bought. That was fun instead. <laughs> and well, my first, one of my first experiences was uh, world of Warcraft. And one of the reasons I bounced off it so quick was I w went and did a quest early in the game. And the quest was go and find, I think it was go retrieve five like boar skins or something like that. So, like I had to kill boars and bring their pelts back to the quest giver. Of course, not every boar has a skin apparently. So I had to kill like 30 of them to get the five <laughs> skins. Oh, shit. You got some <laughs> skinless boars attacking you. Right. And then I get back, I get, I turn them in and like that quest is over. I, you know, and like the next quest was, Exactly the same fucking quest, but a different animal. That a, a lot of MMOs do that, right? Yeah. So I was just like, yeah. this. First of all, clicking on these boars was not that interesting. Second of all, the quest itself, not interesting. And like, why? Why am I killing 
boars that have no skin. Like, the whole thing just turned me off so much. It was, again, I was just like, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're talking there about classic WoW. And then that was, like, I basically said, there's old games and old MMOs used to put you through that grind. It's almost like a rite of passage that you have to go through this hardship to acquire gear to get to a point where you are viable. Uh, nowadays, most games, well included, have had like a, a theme park streamlining that a lot of people lament. Like you say, where's the grind? The grind is gone. You've taken mm-hmm. my grind away. Because you know your hand, handed gear, handed incredibly powerful gear, you speak about having to do a quest. You know The quest is clearly marked on your map. The things are glowing yellow, like kill this thing, and it guaranteed gives you the stuff. And the guy where you hand it in teleports to you for you to have. It's like really handheld. Um, and a lot of people have kind of bounced off games because... They've lost that element of, I'm going to kill 30 boars with a chance to maybe get the skin. So do you think, like, people's tolerance towards the grind has diminished? Because for me, I miss it. You know, I miss wasting evenings just to get the slightest bit of productivity done. You know, I, I want it to be so difficult that it is a, it is a brick wall that, you know, pushes away anyone that's not willing to put the time in. It's it got to be fun, though, Gary. Like, the, the grind itself, to me, has to be fun. Like, the actual, like, so Destiny... I've had grinds in Destiny that really pissed me off. There was a grind, I think it was for a sword, where you had to, you basically had to go to to each of the planets and wait for a certain event to happen. And the event was randomized. So there's like a ch- chance of like four different events happening. And there was no indication in game when or where the event would happen either. You had to use an external website that was somewhat accurate about an event was coming, but you didn't know which one it was coming and it wasn't always accurate. So I sat on Earth for four hours waiting for a certain event to happen. That's the worst kind of grind to me because I'm literally doing nothing. Nothing. Just waiting for the game to, like, okay, we're we're blessing you with this random activity now. And then if you complete it, you can continue on your quest. Meanwhile, you know, there's grind in Destiny, like, just playing game and having fun and all of a sudden a hawk moon drops at the end of an iron banner match and i literally jump out of my seat with excitement you know so it's like there there's there's two levels of it because with that i with the hawk moon i was just playing and having fun and you know that was grinding but Different it didn't kind of feel grind. like it because i was yeah. playing and having fun whereas the grind for the sword was awful <laughs> Brian, I, I remember that, Brian. That was early yeah. in Destiny. And uh, you actually told me about those sites that you could go and find these events coming. Yeah. Kate and I went around to three or four planets looking for them for probably three or four days before we quit. It yeah, was it's terrible. I, I think it's that important to keep the player engaged in an activity. And then, you know, because like there's, there's, I mean, I guess you could say there's different kinds of grinding. You know what I mean? You could say there's quest grinding there's item grinding you know like if you're looking for a specific drop at the end of an activity but i feel like in no way should at any time the developers make you disengage from the game and do nothing to achieve your end goal i feel like like you said it best like you were just playing iron banner i loved that system at the end of crucible when the person at the bottom of the scoreboard would get the exotic and everyone would oh my god that guy got a hawk moon and you know he was just running around half the time like not even playing like you know as frustrating as it was like it was hilarious and it was awesome but i think that's a developer thing that they need to find a way to keep players engaged and grind at the same time i think borderlands did that really well oh yeah it sure did damn um each boss had a specific drop that he could drop so i mean there's you know, there's 100, 100 plus bosses in that game. You gotta watch that frame rate in Borderlands, though, Wilson. Right? You know? Yeah, I know. It's whew, was I Why is it so <laughs> slow? Why is it so <laughs> slow? But um, yeah, I feel like Borderlands did it even better than Destiny. As big of a fan as I am of Destiny, I feel like Borderlands did it really good with each boss having a specific piece of loot. Actually, I think a lot of them had two pieces of loot. Yeah. That were specific to them so i don't know i really hope to see more of that in future games because i really enjoy it people call it inflation longevity of content and it's just what i like to do yeah but they gotta 
they got to do that though, because if you just make a game like they used to make for the NES or the Super NES that you play through for it's you play it through and it's like like a legit playthrough is like three or four hours and you try and charge sixty dollars for that in this, this day and age, you fucking laughed out of here, right? Right. So they've got to find ways of increasing player engagement and figuring out ways to let the players stay in this world for longer periods of time. And when you when you get into a game like this and you know, start looking at like player engagement, when the company starts looking at player engagement, engage games as a service, like they gotta figure out ways to keep people engaged for long periods of time. And the grind is definitely one of them. You just gotta be smart about it. Before we move to the next topic, Briar, I just wanted to tell you I was in a completely different world, but I had the same experience when it comes to EverQuest. I was playing it on PlayStation 2, believe it or not. I bought this little portable hard drive, like a little Ethernet port that you stick on the back of the PlayStation 2. You plug in your Ethernet. Who remembers this shit? I bought the mouse and keyboard. Did he just say he plugged his Ethernet into his hard drive? No. It it was an (laughs) Ethernet port that you buy. You know, I... It was a portable hard drive. I I was just (laughs) laughing at Gary's face when he said an Ethernet port for the back of your PlayStation. Gary freaked up and kind of had a look on his face. It's true. Look, in in order for you to play online back in those days, you had to buy a portable hard drive that slid into the back of your PlayStation 2. Then you had to get the Ethernet port, which is a a separate purchase. Stick that on the back of that. And then you plug the Ethernet into that, and you were able to go online. Resident Evil Outbreak was one of the games I played. Uh, and of course, EverQuest, which is my first, I think the first time in my life I ever played an MMO. And, you know, it was, uh, yeah, voice chat and, and typing back and forth to people. To me, it was amazing. I played it for probably about a fucking week. And I think I spent close to $250 just for that experience, Brian. I had to buy a keyboard, funny. keyboard, a mouse, a game, a hard drive, an Ethernet port. I, I, all for I, mean, a game I had a completely different experience to you guys on MMOs. And that was just, you know, well, I wanted to hear how you guys felt it there but that's what got me hooked you know the first the first proper mmo i played was a arpg style looked like diablo uh, but it was an mmo you know everyone else in the game is a real person it was a game called yeah. legend of mia um made by like an indie developer it wasn't a big one um, and then i moved on to like dark age of camelot etc but what got me was i got into the game and then someone ran by it was like a level 40 or something and I spoke to my friend. I was like, how do you get that gear? And he's like, you've got to put like so-and-so 100,000 hours, whatever in. And I was like, all right, where do we start? Let's clear the schedule. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> playing. That, that's why I no, love it, Gary, like, man. That was what got me. I was like, wait, you're telling me if I put more hours in and grind more, I can like own all the noobs. And they were like, yeah, you can own all the noobs. And I was like, right, that's it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to begin. Um, so yeah, for me, it was, I, I loved all that. So I guess it's, it's a Marmite thing. Some people love the idea of mindlessly banging your head against a wall for weeks on end to get one level. Uh, and some people find that frustrating. Um, I found value in it. But Subjective I'm gaming. You know? Odd and peculiar, special flower. So You are <laughs> a very, very special flower, Gary. We got any more topics? Yeah, let's revolve. Where are we going? Where are we going? What's the next topic? Uh, I think it's yours, Briar. Uh, I, I don't have the thing up. So, uh, how important is sound to your gaming? Oh shit! Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> I, I can't hear you, Briar. I, <laughs> I, I got. I just got <laughs> this note from my wife. It says, "I think our Ethernet is down." I think oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her when she came in. She was moving fast too. Uh, so, sound and gaming, right? It's it's a funny thing to me because it's such an important topic for me. Like, because I spend a lot of time. Uh, dealing with sound YouTube videos, Twitch streaming. I'm trying to improve the sound quality that I provide constantly, but I also really like music. I also really like to hear sounds and I like to listen to music on good speakers and good headphones. And I spend a lot of time thinking about sound in that way. And when I watch movies, if I'm going to sit down and watch a movie. I like having a subwoofer connected to my TV or to my media viewing experience because you know, getting full surround sound and big bombastic explosions. And, you know, just it's just so much more immersive to me. And the same goes for gaming. When I game, I spend a lot of money on headphones. Yeah. I spend a lot of money on speakers for surround sound setups in my living room. Um, and it's it, to me, it's, it's such an enjoyable thing. But 
I see so many people talking about, well, I just play on the TV monitor speakers. What? Uh, what? No. You know, so many people go out and buy, <laughs> you know, no. $2,000, $3,000 TVs or even, you know, a $1,000 TV. But then they have, they're they using speakers that, you know, spit out. They don't even point at the person who's watching the TV. They <laughs> point at the wall behind the TV because they're trying to hide those fuckers now. And, like... Like I understand, like the visual point of view for a game or for a for a movie or something is an important one, but you're you're missing out on like that surround sound experience and that that detailed sound. It's just it makes me crazy, guys. It makes me crazy. <laughs> like, I'm with you, man. I'm all about having sound with it. Like I love going to a good movie theater and having a movie and you feel the explosions and stuff like that. I don't quite really want that in my living room, maybe, but like. I do have, like, if I'm not listening through my headphones, which, like, a lot of the times if I have the option to, I will, even if I'm sitting here watching a movie by myself, mm -hmm. just so I can get that immersive feeling. Yeah. I have to have it with video games. I used to be very against headphones having anything but my chat audio coming through it. And I was one of those guys that would have their TV on, and you'd be able to hear me playing while I'm talking to you, <laughs> peacefully. And, uh... It's changed drastically. I want all my audio coming through my headphones. And yeah, it's, you know, I think a good entry level set of headphones to start with are Astros. I know some other people might have some differing opinions on that, but I think they're good for gaming. They're a good entry level set of headphones. Turtle Beach um, is probably a little better as far as yeah. you know, ground floor level, entry level. Yeah, Astros that's true. are a little bit more expensive. Yeah, they're, and, they're a little bit more. But... It's better quality. I would just say make the jump, man, especially with the mix amp. Like having control of volume of game audio and party audio may change the way you feel about other headphones. I think that's essential to have, especially, I mean, not even just for streaming, you know, I've had my mix amp before I ever got, you know, had done some streams or, you know, even the podcast or anything like that. I think it's very important to be able to balance your audio. Um, I think it's two sides of the same coin, like audio and video. I think they're both equally important. Um, but what about you, Gary? What do you, what do you think? Uh, I'm probably as much of an audio snob as I am a video snob. Um, PC, up there PC in the, snob. the same level of snobbery. For me, audio is, is a big thing. Uh, I like to know that the audio sounds good and I like to hear audio that sounds good myself. Um, so myself, like these headphones that I've got on, um, I bought a couple maybe three weeks ago. Um, these are studio what they call reference headphones, so they're completely open back. Um, they're unlike so Astros, um, at least the the A40TRs are like a closed back headphone or at least semi open headphone. So the sound almost sounds like it's coming from in your head, whereas these are like open ear, so it's it's room filling sound. It's kind of like an ambient sound. Sounds more like uh, a speaker as opposed to a headphone. Exactly, yeah. The the Bayer Dynamic DT990 250 ohm um, headset or headphones so you won't hear i guess you won't see many gamers with it actually ninja um ninja kappa you know ninja hd the got the PUBG streamer mm -hmm. um he uses these and it's kind of what got me interested in researching a bit more about them but yeah making the jump to a proper audio grade headphone is is like again another jump up like you said astros are a jump from the the bundled earbuds that you get with the playstation that's but, like what i'd call step one <laughs> yeah it's a <laughs> It's a big jump. But then going on to these, if you've got them powered correctly and you've got an amp that can supply the power for these headphones, it's astronomical the amount of range that you get. And modern music, um, stop me from going too deep, but modern music tends to be compression heavy. So it, everyone's competing for your attention. So you'll find that all ranges of sound, right the way from the drum beats down to the treble to the low bass, they compress it to a point that all of it sounds the same volume. So it's being blared at you. You just don't have that dynamic range of sound. These headphones don't have, you know, unless you've got a compressed source, they don't have any compression in the sound that they have that the, the mix amps put on on the Astros. So you get a real true and complete range of sound. For me, audio grade headphones are just a necessity when I either play games or watch media. Once you move up to a good set of headphones, uh, what you, you'll discover is not only like our the you know the explosions and the music and the gunshots much more epic but you can start hearing things like enemies footsteps and using that to your advantage you know um you know the 
the reason I got into uh, Astros originally is when I was playing a lot of Call of Duty. And Astros have a feature where you, you can flip a switch on them that it lowers the volume of the bass and raises the level of the treble, which allows, which is just the right range for the footsteps in Call of Duty games or before they start flying around. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it was, it was basically a game breaking feature to be able to use the, the headphones because this was at a time when people were still using TVs that had one speaker. They didn't have even stereo sound. And you're sitting here and you've got fully 3D sound and you can you can literally hear this guy coming around the corner and have your gun just sitting there waiting for him to pop out the corner. PUBG Damn. is the same way. I've been playing a lot of PUBG that. lately and it really brings me back to the days of playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and like those older Call of Duties that were sound whoring was a real thing. And getting a good pair of headphones can really help your performance in competitive multiplayer games. Like, really, um, depending on the game, if, wow. it, if it supports that kind of feature. Um, there's a, there is a definite price to performance kind of leveling off that happens at the high range of headphones. Like, you know, if you, if you go from TV speakers or you know, the headset that comes with your Xbox One or your PlayStation, and then just go up to like a 50 or $100 pair of headphones that you get from Turtle Beach at Best Buy or, you know, whatever company's making these. Yeah. That's going to be the biggest jump you make. Once you move up to uh, $250 Astros, you know, the, the jump between those Turtle Beaches at $100 and those $250 Astros is smaller than from the $100 Pearl Beaches to the you know PS4 headset, right? And that continues to level off as you spend more money. Uh, I'm using $400 headsets right now. Are they twice as good as Astros or twice the cost? No, of course not. They sound better than Astros for music, for games. Uh, I, could, I couldn't honestly say. If you go up to a $1,000 set of headphones, like the Sennheiser, uh, I can't remember the model number, they sound better than these. Is it... Twice as good? No, it's not twice as good. You know, it starts leveling off. Yeah. So what, if you get up to that $100 price point, though, you get pretty good sound out of just about anything in that price point. What I would say, and it's almost a continuation of the topic that we did last week around gaming peripherals, if you're looking at headphones specifically and you've either got a separate mic or you can put on a mod mic, like the Antlion mod mic, yeah. well, Actual audio headphones made by audio manufacturers will probably give you a better experience. Mileage might vary, of course, but you know Sennheiser, Bayer Dynamic, these these sort of companies, Blue microphones, um, you know the headphones that that, that Briar's using, all of them are going to be arguably better headphones than people like Turtle Beach and Astro and Logitech, HyperX, etc. Um, you know, generally speaking. But they're not going to have the gaming specific feature. Like, uh, you know, the, the Astros have that switch to turn up the treble. Um, they also have a, you know, swing down mic. And on the A40s, you can just take that mic right off. Um, uh, you know, there's there's mute buttons on these things. You can add a mod mic to any set of headphones, but it's going to cost you an extra 100 bucks. Um, I really appreciate people who have spent a little bit of extra time making sure that their mic is okay. Because... I don't want to hear your fucking $5 mic all night. It sucks. <laughs> you know, like, hey, I got a $400 pair of headphones and I'm listening to your $5 mic. That's not That's awesome. That's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody you're like, is, is somebody inside of a bag of potato chips right now? Like, right? It, gets, it gets going. Like, but I, I feel like you made a really, really good point about how having a good pair of headphones can help you with a competitive edge. Um, PUBG and Call of Duty are perfect examples, but another really good one, and it doesn't always have to be um, a particular game like that, but in Destiny, where there really are no footsteps, but there is um, other audio cues, like when people activate their super, grenades, anything of like that, what type of gun you hear. You know, if I hear a thousand yard stare and I'm on Pantheon, I'm not going to run down the middle. You know what I mean? So it's it can definitely help you out. These audio cues can be very faint, too, and they get lost in the mix on a shitty speaker. Uh, but if you have a decent speaker or a decent set of headphones, you do hear these things. Even, And I'm not just saying you need to play with headphones. You can play with a decent sound bar and get a lot of the benefits, you know? Uh, but headphones are, I think, the best. 
Yeah, I got a pretty decent Vizio soundbar that I use when I'm, you know, when I'm really in the mood to have that boom bastic sound. But my very first gaming headset was actually gifted to me by my good friend B. Ara. Thank you, Briar. He uh, sent me some Turtle Beach headphones, and that was the very first time I'd ever had a gaming headset. And I put it on, it changed my life. I've been through about three or four pairs of Turtle Beach, and now I'm, I've kind of settled on the Uncharted 4 edition of Sony Gold. They've been doing me well. I mean, they get the job done, especially when I'm, you know, just playing a quick match or two of whatever competitive multiplayer game I'm playing. But sound definitely matters. I'm happy we uh, had a chance to talk about this. I mean, I've literally stopped playing with one of my friends who who has your setup, you say, of, of actually having the speakers playing the sound back to me. Yeah. And then he has his girlfriend in the same room who's watching, like, Celebrity Love Island or some shit. I've watched most of that <laughs> series secondhand through his bloody audio. <laughs> Because it sort of comes through through there, but yeah, I just won't play on mic with him now. It sucks. It's just, yeah. It sucks. You know, like you gotta look. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie to it. I like playing with people on stream. Like I like inviting people into the stream to play. Every once in a while, you got a guy that literally seems to be talking to you through a potato, or, or, or <laughs> like it, it's a potato chip because it sounds like it's still in the bag, and like there's an echo coming, and you can hear his TV, and like you gotta like start working through how to fix his mic with him. And then eventually you get to the point, I'm sorry, I just have to mute you because mm -hmm. like, not only is it grading to me, but like, I'm trying, I got an entertainment product that I'm trying to do here. <laughs> right. And like, like, I'm sorry. Like nobody wants to listen to your shitty mic. You're a cool dude. Nothing, nothing, nothing personal, but that mic is fucking garbage. <laughs> the mic, yeah. Things got personal for them. It's very considerate to make sure your audio is as good as possible, especially for streamers. Like, I mean, you'll see it in chat. Someone will, You'll see different emotes of people reacting to someone's microphone or yeah. you know what i mean like it's just courteous yeah and we want to hear your beautiful voice for you you know what i mean like oh, we don't... Right. <laughs> yeah, i don't i don't want to mute you and i want to play with you but i i do have to mute people on occasion when it just sounds awful you know when it just sounds awful or you got like a you know, if you got a baby crying, maybe it's not time to play with other people. <laughs> maybe it's time to go talk oh. to that fucking baby. Yeah. <laughs> See why it's crying. I know that firsthand. Yes. Great real world example, actually, of the difference of audio. If anyone caught our premiere podcast on Podbean the or iTunes, the audio only version, I recorded the entire show with my Logitech <laughs> webcam mic because I'm a fucking professional. Yes. Um, and you can hear the difference there um between this the, you know any other show and the first if you want a bit of a snapshot into what bad audio does and how awful it can make a recording check out our first ever audio only version and you'll hear how terrible i sounded i still loved it gary it's hard to not love you know it's like self-help every time i talk to you i feel like you helped me somehow even so saying that i feel better <laughs> i do too I feel like yeah. I'm more relaxed. I feel like my blood pressure's gone down. I'm gonna down, you know, live Blair. longer. Like this yeah. is great. Great. It's like yes, listening to the Gary talk your body is, is uh, flowing towards another body part, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> listening to Gary talk is like the opposite of eating pork. Somehow you just get healthier. It's great. And right. smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel dumber because you say yes. <laughs> yeah, but he he makes you feel dumb but then he tells you why, thus making you more educated in the process. Yeah, I'm, I'm thank you for explaining no. to me how stupid I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true only it's only when you pull that toaster out the rest of the time we call. <laughs> it's always close, Gary. Yeah, I'm always. All right. Was well, it were you on the next topic? Yeah, uh, next topic I wanted to talk about was the death of video game box art and manuals. So, like, whatever happened to manuals and awesome box art? I mean, I remember back in the day, I mean, instantly, when I talk about box art, I'm instantly brought back to the Atari ColecoVision era of just some of the most intricate, amazing artwork that looks like it belongs in like a fantasy novel. You know what I mean? Whether it be space mm -hmm. or medieval setting or something, it just had some of the most amazing box art out there. And it was what you saw first before you turned over the box to see what the game was out on, on the back. And I know a lot of that had to do with, you know, there's internet now and Twitch and all that stuff. And there's more platforms for people to get their games information out there. But, you know, you look at uh, Nintendo games, you know, they came with a, a manual that 
not only had detailed instructions on how to play the game, but a lot of times there's a lot of backstory or lore, or it would set the story of the game up to where you start playing, and you knew what was going on as soon as you started playing the game. Um, Reading I feel that like shit Nint- in the back of the seat, back seat on the way home. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. My mom would take me to Toys R Us back in the day when you'd go pull the ticket down off the wall. You'd well, you'd you'd. The, I remember those the, days. Look at the yeah. box art, you know, and you'd flip it up to see the back of the box art. You'd grab the ticket, you'd take it up there. Mom and dad would pay for it, get in the car, bust that seal off, and instantly start going through the manual. So by the yeah. time you got home, you were even more prepared to play the game. And it was like Brad said, it was something to do on the way home. I used to draw. I used to take them to school with me and draw out of them. I used to put them behind my uh, my books, like I was reading. I was like reading in <laughs> Nintendo manuals, and, uh, and this is why Wilson only proceeded to the fourth grade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like, uh, and then they also used to bundle like uh, strategy guides, and like the first game that comes to mind to me was when I bought Earthbound as a kid, and it came in the big box with the strategy guide. Huge, yeah. And there were so many extra picture pictures and lore and things that you wouldn't know how to do unless you read the player's guide or you know heard it from a friend on the playground and stuff. And I guess out of all of this, like um, PC games. Remember, remember oh PC God. game PC box games art. Were oh, yeah, they were beautiful. And like, kind of going back to our topic with swag a little bit, they came with some of the coolest stuff too. And those big boxes, they really did. Yeah. Um, but I guess my question to you guys is: Do you miss the old era of picking a game, picking up a game based off the box art and having a detailed instruction manual? And what were some of your favorite, most memorable uh, box arts? From back in the day. Ooh, man. I, I don't miss that day. I mean, I, I do appreciate the box art, but I don't miss the days of going to the local video game store. And the only information I had to go on <laughs> was <laughs> an artist rendition of the main character. <laughs> doing something that they doing never do in the fucking game. fucking awesome, right? Like, <laughs> You're talking about Mega Man 1, right? Do you remember Mega that Man box art cover? Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so deceiving dude it was it was cool for what it was but like after playing the game you're like this box art has nothing to do with it man <laughs> no, it, it so rarely did like <laughs> metal gear uh metal gears box art was basically just the terminator poster with yep that was painted um the the problem was back then, that that box art was cool and i think is to be appreciated the problem was back then though that it was not representative of the game and to get reviews of the game, you had to have a magazine subscription and you had to wait till a month after the game came out for that magazine subscription to tell you, or for that magazine to tell you if this game was any good. And we just didn't like, as a kid, I just didn't have access to that stuff. So I, you know, if I was lucky enough to get a birthday present and my mother would take me to, um, to KB toy store so I could buy a video game. I was literally just staring at boxes thinking, which cool. one's got the coolest box? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I fall directly in line with what Briar's thoughts here. I remember, the, you know, the old school days, the mid '80s, early '90s, where, you know, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, they would have these amazing hand drawn box arts of these characters just doing unbelievable shit, looking so incredible, with you know mysterious backdrops and, like you said, fantasy space settings. And when you look at that. To me, you know, looking back, I think even back then, it was a poor representation of what you actually saw in the game. So I don't necessarily miss it. To me, it's more of a nostalgia thing. Of course, you know, it's nice to see it every now and then. I got old stuff I can pull out and look at it for what it was. But I think as technology uh, moved forward, I think that, you know, video game systems offer ways for people to experience entertainment visually. And as technology moved forward, you could also... I, I think it was... PlayStation who did it, uh, that you could actually go, when you played one of their games, you could see the manual online or see the manual I do on the that. actual, on so the disc. You could that's see the it thing right- I do miss, though, is that you used to buy a game and you get all those pack-ins, but now, you know, like our previous conversation tonight, that shit is all sold separately, right? Mm-hmm. You get, to get, like, if they sold Earthbound today, oh, man. there would be a base... Earthbound with just the cartridge, and then there'd be an eighty dollar version of Earthbound with the fucking strategy guide in it, right? And like all that extra shit. I mean, that's what they've done. Is the stuff stuff still exists, right? It's just compartmentalized. You you used to buy a fifty dollar PC game, and it would come in a big ass box with 
you know, either discs or, you know, later CDs. And in it would be, you know, a full size fold out map of the world that you're about to explore. There'd be a novel with a, you know, book uh, like explaining, you know, maybe the character you're playing or some other character's story in this same world. There'd be, you know, maybe some dice, you know, maybe some trinkets, maybe a keychain, maybe a pin, like mm -hmm. all sorts of fucking random shit was in those boxes. But it was cool opening them up because you didn't know what was going to be in there when you opened it. It was kind it's of like, like four guys. Yeah, yeah. One, one of my most memorable. Oh, go ahead. What did you say, Gary? I was saying some companies are still doing that. So if you look at, uh, I mean, people that want to keep it alive, but like CD Projekt Red, so the Witcher series. All three of the Witcher series, without getting the collector's editions, just the standard editions, came with some great packings. You know, I remember the, um, the Witcher 1 um, and 2, Assassination of Kings. Like, it came in like a, a nice little PC box, and that wasn't that old as a game. With, like you say, dice, counters, a map of Novigrad City, um, some cool lore back on Geralt and the, the Witcher schools. And I think Witcher 3 recently came with a map. A uh, little mini art book and some other bits and pieces packed into the um, into the the PS4 um, jewel case. But sorry, Wilson. You. Oh no, I was just gonna say. Uh, Briar was saying, you know, it comes with maps of the overworld and maybe a book with story. First thing that comes to mind for me um, was the original Legend of Zelda on the NES. It gave you, granted, you know, we're talking about PC, but you know, uh, NES did it too with giving you an entire map of the entire, just all of the overworld. For you to draw on, put little post-its, you know, uh, candle this tree, bomb this wall, you know, like um, huge stories. Like, uh, I mean, I'm talking like the instruction manual was pretty thick for the original Legend of Zelda. I think it was and color I think you got, too, wasn't it? Yes, it was all color. And I think I think you guys nailed it with box art. Um, but I really do miss the manuals a lot. That was one of my favorite things. Uh, I read more as a kid than I do now. But I feel like if games came with more... Uh, literature, I would be more apt to read them. I don't want to read the same health, health, uh, health and safety warning, you know, a million times because that's all you get with the little insert that you get now. Yeah. And but what were some of the what were some of the most memorable cover arts for you guys? I know we had mentioned uh, Mega Man One. I was Russian say Attack though, like... was a big one for me <laughs> because it looked so badass. And then when I played the game, I was like. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> you got duped. Yeah, you man. nailed it too, man. Oh, we've all man. had we've all had that experience <laughs> where you bought something based on the cover art, and you go home and you go, "What the fuck is this?" Right? It's like we no are. returns, man. I couldn't bring that thing back. I was stuck with that. Game. That was gonna be my game for the next six months to a year. <laughs> right. I don't know what it's like in the states as well, but talking about box art and that. Uh, in the UK, the biggest concern I have is that we're just not going to see it ever anywhere. So we've got maybe, well, one dedicated store, um, national store that sells games, and one that kind of does it as a sideline. It's like a music store that also sells games, and the rest of it's just supermarkets. So I don't know if the, the, the US has presence, but I remember walking into four or five shops on the high street that would all have, like, an aisle of amazing-looking boxes and I just don't want to see that go away and end up with like, you know, that being a memory because I'm we're talking about what our favorite box arts was. I could close my eyes now and tell you exactly what the Doom cover looks like and the Quake Three Arena logo on the on the gray box with the red Quake thing, just because I'd seen them around and I'd seen them everywhere and I just can't remember seeing that anywhere. I mean, do you have that in the states? You still have aisles and, and shops that sell games. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We still have like retail look brick and mortar stores that you can go to and look at games and stuff, but like. Some of the ones that, like, where the box art was true to the game. I mean, I look at any of the Castlevanias that's on what NES. I'm saying, right now, that's the one I was going to say. Castlevania yep. One. Yep. Contra was a good one. Um, I'd say Metroid, but if you knew nothing about Metroid and you saw the yellow box cover with just Samus, you wouldn't really know what the heck was going on. You know what Wait, I mean? I think it's. it's Metroid, I thought Metroid was, some of those Nintendo games just showed the pixel art of, like, the main character. Was Metroid one of those? Metroid oh, had no. two variations for the NES. There was a, um, one that you're talking about where it's pixelated with a silver edge, and then there was a yellow label one that was actually the artwork where she's crouching with her oh, okay. blaster like that. So there's, there's label variants and stuff like that out there. For, for me, Wilson, um, uh, to expound on what you just said, um, uh, you asked what, box art 
is most memorable to us. And for me, it was Castlevania one. Uh, I was a young kid when Castlevania came out and it was one of the truest box arts because you get this silver outline. You got Simon Belmont holding a whip. You see this huge mountain with this giant castle going up and you see Dracula in the background kind of as like a, a mist form, like smiling and looking very foreboding. And it signified for me exactly what that experience would be. Like you're going through this huge trial. You're going to fight this incredible enemy. And you're just this guy with this whip. And for me, and you know, the box art, of course, looked amazing for the time. And it still stands up today. But for me, that, you know, it kind of molded me. I'm a huge Castlevania fan. I think all the Castlevania box arts have been phenomenal. But Castlevania 1, for me, it really, it stuck with me for my entire life. Uh, because it, it meant so much. And it actually translated from that box into the experience that you had in the game. And it just looked amazing to me. That's what the function was, right? Is like, that's why they had to do those artist renditions. Because if you were to look at just the, the, a picture of the gameplay, it's, it, you might have not been able to figure out what you were looking at. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. would put these, you know, artist rendition of what this game is to kind of give you an impression of the world that you're about to step into. And, and maybe, like, because the graphics were so, you know, early, they're so primitive compared to what we play now, that might have been your only impression of what you were looking at. Castlevania, definitely not, but there were definitely some games, especially, I would say, in the Atari. Oh, age, yeah, you uh, had no where, idea what you were doing. It piece, was yeah. so abstract that the, the only reason you knew that that was an alligator that you were swinging over with Pitfall Harry is because... It, <laughs> It said so on the box. box yeah. <laughs> like, that thing didn't look like a fucking alligator. <laughs> yeah. Or the or the instruction manual had a picture of it and said, "Yeah, alligator." alligator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You they know? would tell you, they would show you a graphical representation of the enemies and then tell you what it was. Sometimes they'd even have like description and lore for those characters yeah. in the manual. Yeah. Good days. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Good old it's, days. It's, it's certainly um, you know we've had Evolution Four, but I. I personally, I'm a sucker for, for packaging still, and there's one type of packaging that always gets me. I mean, I'll buy, a, I would definitely buy this edition. I say about buying a collector's edition, but if that's not available, I always have to then have the steel book. So I've got like so many steel books at home, and again, games that I'm not even that bothered about. For some reason, for me, if you put the art of the game on a steel book, it's instantly more desirable. So any of you have a, a steel book fetish, or again, is this just a, a Gary problem? I bought the steel books steelbooks. for Destiny. All the Destiny versions that have offered them, I bought them all for the Call of Duty versions that offered them, and for the Halo versions. It's very much like a only for the the games that I love the most. I, I got, uh, I believe it's Final Fantasy twelve steelbook version. Um, I want to say I gotta I gotta look over here and remember, but I definitely think they're more attractive and. And they're more unique, and you want to buy them as soon as you see them as well, Gary. Steel books are all, they're just awesome and just in they're its nice. form by itself. Yeah. I have a Doom for, I think it's Doom 3 Steelbook, which is pretty cool. Xbox, baby. Yeah. Oh, gee. Yeah. I mean, if I could throw out all of my Blu rays and replace them all with Steelbooks tomorrow, I would. I mean, they're just, they're nice. You know, they look aesthetically pleasing. I don't know. Something for me talking about box art. If you put it on a Steelbook, I'll buy it. Yeah, I don't have too many of those. I'm looking right now. Old school. All right, so where are we revolving to next, guys? Uh, another one of Briar's, to uh, Briar's topics here. Uh, the, you, yeah, the final he can't, shot. He can't uh, <laughs> see it, so I'll, I'll read it for you, Briar. Is Apple still relevant? Briar's opinion and Oh, okay. Rant. All right, I got this. Okay, so look. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> I've had a real problem. I Over the last few years, many years, I have been an Apple fanatic. There was actually a point where um, I wouldn't allow a PC into my house. I wouldn't allow it. Uh, I didn't. It came from a place where I was formerly into IT, and I just didn't want to support a PC in my home. I did not want to come home from a day of work and have to fix, fix a fucking PC. That was the <laughs> deal, right? And, I, you know, I had Macs. I was a Mac user. And they just didn't break. They didn't have problems. You didn't have a problem with a Mac. You you open the thing up or you turn it on, and it would just work. And the operating system was stable. You could run a Mac for a month and never have to reboot it. Whereas a PC, 
I mean, if you could run it for 24 hours and not reboot it, you're doing pretty fucking good. <laughs> so true. <laughs> but unfortunately, over the last probably year and a half, uh, I've started to really fall out of love with Apple's. Uh, specifically their computers, but in other aspects as well. Um, I, you know, I still think that their OS is the best OS on earth. Like, I absolutely adore Mac OS. It, it runs great. It's fast. It's easy to use. It's simple. It does what you expect it to do. And it doesn't have all the problems and the legacy support that Windows is saddled with. When you want to delete a program, you grab the program and you move it over to the trash and you're fucking done. You don't have to uninstall. You don't have to worry about like it leaving shit behind. It's just gone. Mm -hmm. But their hardware, they've moved to a point where the hardware is, it's obviously beautiful, but it's not powerful enough. It doesn't do what I need it to do, right? So I've started to move over to PCs. And I, I got to say, Windows 10 is much better than it used to be. Or Windows 10 is much better. Windows, than 8. Than Windows 8 was Fucking heinous. Briar used to shit on me. This, we're talking three and a half years ago. He'd shit on me every single day. Anytime I brought up the fact that I was on Windows 8. And I was very happy when Windows 10 came out as well, Briar. Oh, Windows my God. 10 Windows is, 8. I mean, Windows 8.1 was a big update. It was a big improvement to Windows 8 usability-wise. But Windows is saddled with issues that, you know, they just don't need to be. You know, their support for legacy software, they, they need to cut that off at some point, right? The fact that there's still DLLs and driver issues and, and registry issues, all this shit that we've been dealing with for fucking 20 years on Windows is just like, why? Why do we still need to be doing this? Haven't we moved on past here? So it's sad to me that when that Macintosh or Apple doesn't make any hardware on the PC side of things that as a content creator, I need, right? As and I got to say, I really like my PC. I really like gaming on it. I really like, I like the tinkering of the, of the PC. When I have time to start messing around with the internals, that's cool. And that's fun. And it's, it's a good hobby, but I don't really like windows. <laughs> like I, I don't really dig it. You know, like it's sad to me that, you know, hopefully I actually think Apple may be m making a play into gaming in the near future. You know, Nvidia just re announced that they made, uh, their drivers, their newest drivers, are now compatible with Mac OS. Um, uh, hmm. Apple announced the new Mac Pro that's definitely not aimed at gamers, but there's another or Mac iMac Pro that's definitely not aimed at gamers, but does have gaming quality graphics cards in it. Um, and the the Mac Pro is scheduled for release next year, which could be something special. We'll see. But I, I don't know, man. It's just I was so torn on the Apple thing. It's like. They've treated me so good for so long, but god damn, they just don't it's make a, hardware for me anymore. Yeah, they, they don't want to change. I mean, uh, I guess three or four years ago, you were fine because, uh, you know, even people on, on Mac a few years ago were able to play base quality games. But as the these, you know, graphics cards became more powerful and the, you know, the demand for power, uh, Apple just refused to budge in that direction. And it's kind of sad to see an Apple like, as you, like yourself. Uh, say that you're moving over to PC as much as you, I know, on the inside of your soul, loathe the idea of doing so. <laughs> I know it. I mean, I, Apple have always seen as the the champagne socialists of the the PC space. So, like, <laughs> very much they sit there, um, sort of in their glass house, throwing stones left, right, and center. So this whole idea of why do we have DLLs and a registry, and why do we have driver compatibility issues? Yeah. It's really, really easy to optimize your operating system when you offer two hardware builds or like one hardware build with two variations of like hard drive space and maybe one graphics card variant. Mm -hmm. Their hardware pool is so limited, you know, and limited in a really, really basic way. They don't have support for a lot of titles and games. You're running, but I mean, most people who have a Mac, I mean, I'm going to ask you this question. If Mac's so great, do you have boot camp on your Mac? Yes. Yeah. So everyone that runs a Mac also runs Windows on it because they know that there's not everything that a Mac can do. If they want to run games, they run it on Windows. They don't run it on Mac. Um, you know, my other half's got arguably the best iMac you can get at the moment, the best spec iMac you can get. And it still can't run a decent frame rate on League of Legends. You know, what? which is like 
Wow. It's a 5K screen. Unless she runs it in non-native and the thing looks like it's been, you know, Vaseline smeared over this lovely 5K retina display if you're running it in, like, an acceptable resolution for frame rates. She can run it in boot camp and double her frame rate. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous that anyone in this day and age would ever consider Mac as viable. I just think if you took the Mac OS and put it into the same ecosystem and hardware space the PC has to, or Windows, sorry, has to operate in, you'd see all the same issues that you see on a Mac. So you can, and you don't. You can build a PC and, and put Mac OS on it, and you just don't see the same problems. So you're telling me it will run compatible with any hardware configuration? Not any hardware configuration. You have to you have to be fairly selective about what hardware you put into it, but you can, you can buy new hardware and build yourself a PC and then put the Mac OS on it, and it'll run well. Mm. Well, do you guys think like, I mean, obviously Apple uh, caters to a, a completely different crowd. It does. Different, a, a completely different type of, I feel like it's more of a, um, a businessy ease of access type um, computer. Whereas, I mean, I look Casual. at it as like, and this isn't a, this isn't a diss, but I look at it as like, you know, buying a moped or a Harley. You know, sometimes you just want to cruise, and other times you want to cruise really, really fast and do stuff that a that a moped might not be able to. And like I said, that's not a diss. You're not wrong, that, Wilson. I, I got to say, is when I use – what made me fall in love with the Mac was that when I turned that thing on, it fucking worked. And it was easy to use, and it was reliable. And the software they make for a Mac, it looks better, and it functions better to me than the equivalent software – you know, okay, so right, I, I use a computer all day, every day. And my editing software on the Mac is Final Cut Pro 10. And my editing software on a PC is Premiere Pro. Just on a design, just the just looking at the software, Premiere Pro is uglier. It's not as attractive to, to look at on a daily basis. But that ugliness goes deeper. The menus don't make as much sense. They, you know, they they move around on you without you knowing why. You know, the difference is the Mac on the Mac. You know, you have this you have this big piece of aluminum, gorgeous, and this big piece of glass, and you know, it's just there's a functional, there's a design quality to it that it's just much more appealing, and the, that goes into the software design too. But do you would, think that hardware different kind is of user. more attractive? Because for oh, yeah. me, that big piece of aluminum is the most impractical piece of horseshit I've ever seen. Oh, so, like, fucking it gorgeous, is. man! Why is I it? think it's no, gorgeous. Right. I like yeah. it, okay. sleek, slim, okay. better than all a the, giant box sitting around with the, with the you know shit tons points, of cables hanging out of it. All the access points to it yeah. are on the back of the screen. Well, that's because you've, you've point. gone and fucked up and you put your Mac in the corner like a fucking asshole. That thing should be on a pedestal in the middle of the room displayed <laughs> like the piece of art it is, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm on Team Brian. The Mac on the right pedestal. Right now, damn it. The only place a Mac should be is in front of a pretentious hipster at a Starbucks when they're typing up their novel. That's literally the only place you see them. I would, I would argue they're pretty good for college students. Like I think I well, feel like you know for college, college students student, can afford a Mac. That's, <laughs> okay, okay. I hear you. Yeah. Going hard, but, uh, going but I'm hard. saying, you know, if you could, if you if you went to college, I guarantee, I know you, Gary. If you got a laptop PC, you'd go through four of them by the time you graduated. When you could have just bought one Mac at the beginning, and it could have lasted you all through college. And the fact that you can't game on it that well makes it less tempting to i mean yeah like you said you can run boot camp and you can run a lot of games but i mean it's not optimal and you know it, i'm lazy i wouldn't want to do that i'd rather just but, have a pc but me, i'm saying me. as a college student for as much stuff breaks for college kids or stuff that doesn't work or they don't have time to fix mac is a perfect option but you make an amazing point about the price kind of makes that null. The, well, okay. So here's a here's the deal with the price though. When you buy a MacBook Pro, the thing's made out of solid aluminum. It's milled from aluminum. The thing is tough as nails. It you know it come. It's not plastic. It doesn't have like 
fucking screws holding plastic pieces in. The hinge doesn't wear out after a year. The notebook screen flops down every time you try and put it in a certain spot. They, the, the, the feet don't fall off, and all of a sudden the, the whole laptop wobbles because one of the rubber feet fucking fell off of three months ago. Like the thing is built with quality, and yeah, that costs more. <laughs> no, I bought an Asus aluminium unibody Mac knockoff, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Laptop for five hundred dollars equivalent to a uh-huh. fifteen hundred MacBook Pro, mm-hmm. and it's well, an aluminium unibody, same build quality. I don't. Apple Asus, can't justify it. I don't I believe it. Show you right. Post show. I would. I don't like think that metal it. exists. Prior, my, 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 my my Asus UX five hundred one is an aluminum body, and it was a direct competitor for the uh-huh. MacBook. Uh, uh, when it released, I don't believe it, either of you. I got a hey, look. No. I got a fucking you guys webcam. Are just lying to me. Are I can you move my to put webcam these lies out? Are you are you willing to put these lies out in in the what public domain right now like this? <laughs> fucking <laughs> aluminum. That looks like it looks like an aluminum. PC can confirm. It looks like an aluminum cover covering a plastic bottom. <laughs> Really? <laughs> like you're on the verge of hanging up Skype by accidentally closing your computer again. I'm not doing it. Listen, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, I hear you guys. I think that uh, PC laptops have come a long way. I, I think the Razer Blade is a really good example of uh, somebody making a laptop that's really caught up with Apple as far as build quality goes. Um, and you get the benefit of having much higher higher quality components in there. So you get a laser, Razer Blade with a GTX 1080 in it. Uh, yeah. You know, it's got a Core i7 processor. The thing is very capable. Unfortunately, you're saddled with Windows still. <laughs> right. You see, I've never had all these problems that people talk about with Windows. It's, it seems to be, I have more issues with Mac. Maybe it's because I'm not familiar with it. Whenever I go into my fiance's office mm-hmm. and she has any computer issues, immediately the first thing I do is curse at the horrible piece of paper that they call a keyboard that's got like it's just like a flat piece of shit <laughs> with all the buttons missing they put some weird function button where windows meant to be <laughs> control c doesn't work just the, the basic fundamentals it's like i feel like steve jobs sat down when he engineered it and thought how can i trigger pc users at every possible venture with this <laughs> bullshit piece of software and then the people that are indoctrinated enough it's like charles manson's cult once you're in it, you think it's a fantastic idea, but the rest of the world are looking at you like you're a fucking psychopath for using it. I don't and even think just... that Apple fans are big fans of the keyboard. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Nobody likes those fucking keyboards, man. And that's one of the problems with Apple. That's one of the problems with Apple right now is that they're 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 making decisions that don't even it don't even appeal to Apple fans. Is you know they put that stupid fucking touch bar on the top of the laptop keyboard and everybody's like what the fuck is that for that just adds to the cost of it these keyboards they just keep doubling down let's make the keyboard thinner and thinner and thinner but everybody who's typing on one is like this sucks this sucks this sucks go back to the old keyboards we liked we like this apple circa 2010 keyboard why do you have to fuck it up why does why does this laptop that's already a half an inch thing need to be a tenth of an inch thinner and we never get to plug a usb device into it we have to carry dongles for the rest of our life. Why, when, when, when PC users get stuff like uh, GTX 1080s in their laptops, are we stuck with this, uh, you know, Intel Core graphic or graphics or like a a Radeon card from a mobile Radeon card from three years ago? Like, why are why are you doing this still? Like, why are you making these decisions that don't appeal to your fans? Yeah. They've been, I feel uh, like sipping they're catering from the... to that different demographic that we were talking about. I feel like it's more of like a Casual. businessy type thing. Like I see a lot of businesses running on Macs and stuff. And I feel like they're just they know where their money lies and where they're going to make their money. So like, fuck it. Why? I, I why think they're fucking anything? it up, Wilson. I think they're fucking it up because when when Apple was at their best, I would say like from 2005 to 2010, their hardware was awesome. Like you bought, went out and bought a MacBook Pro, and it was the fastest computer you could buy. I don't care if it was a PC or a Mac; it was the fastest laptop you could buy. It was amazing hardware, and it was in a beautiful aluminum unibody case that was solid and well built. And the OS was—they were making great strides on the OS every day. If you go buy hardware now, the hardware feels old. Um, yeah, it's in a beautiful—you know—still they still make beautiful cases, but. You know, if you buy an iMac right now, they, even as a high end, the chances of that processor being thermal throttled in there are very high because there's just mm. not enough fucking airflow in this in this iMac that's this yeah. thick. 
mm-hmm. you know? Like it, it, they have they've moved too far aesthetically. They've gone they've gone too Ooh, far yeah. in the in the area of form and they've lost, lost too much function. of the function. They used to be nailing it right on the head with every product they make. I think this is true with the iPhone. I think it's true with the with their computers. I think it's true with just about everything Apple's doing. And I, I don't know if they they focus too much on side projects like the Apple Car or their new building or what they're doing. But like the fact that I am I, I'm not even like really contemplating buy another Mac. I am fully into PCs. I'm learning I don't like it, but I I'm learning Premiere. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't like the software as much. I I really don't. I, I think Final Cut. I like Final Cut a lot better. I find way better. Way it's better. Easier to use. Final Cut's a way better. Um, it's easier to use. It's just more aesthetically pleasing. Like I just like Final Cut better. Premiere. I'm learning it. It's it's just more complicated to me. It's just more. It's just so much fucking extra bullshit. Um. But I'm I'm doing it because well part of it is because I like I really have gotten into PC gaming and that's just not possible on a Mac. Part of it is because Apple just doesn't sell the fucking hardware that I need to run my business. Like I need powerful hardware if I want to stream. I need powerful hardware to do YouTube. You know, like it just makes life a lot easier. And Apple just isn't selling it anymore. Maybe they're gonna sell it later. I mean, in 2018 they got a new, new Mac Pro coming out. In later in 2017 they got a new iMac Pro coming out. Uh, but right now, if I want a new computer, it's obviously a PC. It's obviously wow. a PC. I mean, I feel like Apple Please is slip. sipping from the same Kool-Aid that Sony's been pouring. I mean, it, if you look at the specs. He dissing everybody. Matt, well, it's the same bullshit specs. Like, look at us. We have a 5K retina display. The same thing you got suckered into with your laptop when they're like, this is a 4K monitor. And they put the pissiest little graphics card that they've scraped from a dumpster like four years ago and put it in to run this like 5K <laughs> retina display. Yeah, yeah, he's like, right ridiculous like why would you it looks great it looks pixel sharp but then you try to put any sort of taxing video onto it you know Fucked. anything it's 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 awful i just i it's, don't understand it's great if you're doing graphics or if a video. like for me like the 5k display on my imac is amazing because i'm editing 1080p video in a window on my display that is actually showing me 1080p you know like so i'm seeing a perfect pixel perfect representation of that video but for video games 5k display i mean 4k display on you got a 1080 ti maybe <laughs> yeah uh gary you're 100 right man when i first bought this laptop i was you know as a guy who's not a pc guy i was like wow this thing's got a um nvidia geforce 960m in it i'm thinking that's a high pretty high number hope it's powerful it's got a 4k touch screen which makes no fucking sense right and then nothing in 4K works. Like it's it's 10 frames per second if I go 4K on anything. You know, I, I went 4K on Tomb Raider and I swear it, it looked like Minecraft. I, I mean, it was moving so slow. I, I didn't know what was happening. So yeah, they, they kind of suckered me in there, uh, 100%. I just want to say on this topic, guys, it started off as Briar's rant. Gary jumped into the rant. He ranted the other direction. I've never seen you two behemoths go head to head in such a meaningful way. And I, I, I just... I appreciate the passion on both sides, uh, and um, as a gamer, I got to side uh, with with Gary on this one. Briar, uh, Windows is a better place to go. I mean, you actually cited as well. Uh, There's no I doubt love- that that clearly, clearly, if you want to play video games on a computer, it's the PC. For productivity apps, I absolutely adore Final Cut. I absolutely adore, uh, you know, I absolutely adore the Mac OS. Like I just what? love that what? OS. Um, but you know, if you want to, if you want to play video games, there's no fucking, let me, let me just say this. I don't know if you remember, league. Briar, you remember, uh, a couple of years ago, my, my computer shitted on me and I had to borrow my brother's MacBook pro Yeah. and I was using final cut pro. Yeah. And to this day, that is the one thing that I dream of. I, I miss it so much, even with this computer, which cut down my production time, my rendering time tremendously compared to my old laptop. But final cut pro was at least. 10 times faster than what I'm using now. It was so fast, so intuitive, so easy to use. And, and I'm like, damn it, why can't they put something like this on Windows? Right. It was just incredible. There was nothing like it. It's still the best rendering software I've ever seen. No question. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 you know, I've been using Adobe Premiere. One of the reasons I'm making videos so slowly these days is because I'm trying to learn Adobe Premiere. And it's just so clumsy. Like, it just feels 
clumsy compared to what I'm used to using. Mm. I'd stick with my Mac, and, uh, you know, at least for well, Mac. You videos. know, Apple's not making that possible these days. You know, mm. Apple's just not making that possible. Like, if I want to buy a PC or a computer right now, it's clear the clear choice is a PC, and unfortunately, yeah. that comes along with Windows. Damn. Like you say, they've they've lost their edge in phones as well. I mean, the the phones now are becoming so homogenized. You know, if you look at an Apple phone, like where do you go though? Like, what do you do? What, I mean, they well, they invented the they didn't invent the phone, but they they made a huge they made huge waves when they introduced the iPhone, and then up until I'd say the iPhone four, like I mean, they were just coming out with unbelievable designs, and the software was making great trades, but. Like, where the fuck do you go from here? Every phone has all the features. Like, what else are you going to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, Apple's commitment was they'd never go into a, you know, a big size, five and a half inch, six inch phablet as it was. They said all our phones are going to be one hand operation. We're never going to concede to peer pressure. We're never going to make phones bigger. You know, you've got the plus range. They're doing all that. They've said our phones will always have the home button. We're always going to have the Apple home button. Have you seen the specs for the iPhone 8? Apparently the, the home button's gone. Again, I mean, it just... In, in all honesty, headphone I mean, jacks. They, Steve Can we Jobs. Get some love for headphone when, jacks? The statements you're talking about were when Steve Jobs was in power, and he died, right. and now there's different people in power. And I don't believe that that company is being run nearly as well as it was when Steve. I don't think it's got the focus that it had when Steve Jobs was eating it. No, they want they want it to look cool or not function cool. Exactly. Nowadays, you know, like when you take away like something like a headphone jack, like I use it every day with my phone. And then, like, you can't charge and have your headphones in at the same time. Like, that's just absolutely wild to me. Like, why that would, yeah. why they'd want to sacrifice that to make it look cooler. <clears throat> I'll go back to the old Zach Moore style phones from, say, By the Bell, the big, uh, big tall ones, if they work better. You know what I mean? Like, I don't give a shit about what the thing looks like. I'm just going to be talking on it. I mean, I really don't, I really don't care if people are going to judge me based on the phone that I use, like as long as it works really good for the, my needs, then Hey, I'm happy with it. But they keep changing and making them thinner and they seem to be more fragile. Like I have dropped <clears throat> this iPhone five has taken some tumbles. Mm -hmm. I'm talking a lot of tumbles and I have not broke the screen. Sam, on the other hand, hers can fall off the couch and just hit something the right way, yeah. like a like a coffee table leg, and the screen is fucked completely. You know what I mean? So like, I have, I'm gonna ride this thing until the fucking wheels fall off, basically. And then when they do, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. Like I said, I may just go back to the Zach Morris phone and the, just the only take have calls. Become commoditized at this. Point. Like you can go to you can go to whatever store you go to to buy a phone at the AT and T, Verizon or or wherever you go to. The phones, it doesn't really matter which phone you get. You know, the phone that's made by Google and the phone that makes made by Apple and the phone that's made by Samsung, they all fucking do the same shit. There's no real yeah. fucking difference anymore between them. What you want to do is you want to get a pager and then a sock full of pennies on quarters and then just roll like that. Go yeah. old school. <laughs> Page me, dog. See, I don't Wilson think you can find one phone. anymore. I don't think you can find a payphone. I don't know where I would even look for one. I mean, I see, I see all the hollow spots on the side of Seven Eleven where they. I saw be. one. I saw one when I was on vacation in Akron, Ohio. Don't ask really? me why I had vacation. Uh, and it actually worked, Briar. I had to pick up the phone and everything. I, a real fucking payphone. Let's get back to. Why'd you take a vacation in Akron, Ohio? That doesn't sound like a vacation. I have, to, I have to explain this shit to everybody when I say it. I'm from Akron, Ohio. I have a mother there, and brother, sister, and Kate's entire family's there, and they're all planning to move so the to Georgia soon. Go on vacation to someplace nice and tell them to come too. They're, look, <laughs> they're doing that next year. Uh, actually, everybody's coming down here to Savannah, but uh, we planned hey, it out. Going we had a to great Detroit, time. Michigan, down to the eight mile stretch. <laughs> shit. I ain't uh, that black. I ain't that black, uh, Gary. <laughs> Go out there and get shot. Hey, he ain't, he ain't talking like we talking down here. Shoot that boy. Um, <laughs> I guess that's it for the uh, topics for, t for this week's episode of Revolver Live. Thank you guys for hanging out with us for another fantastic episode of Revolver Live. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. That's twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. If you're unable to see the live feed, 
The videos will also be up on YouTube at Briar Rabbit's YouTube channel and the Beastly Gamer YouTube channel, respectively. Yeah, but don't watch it on Beastly's channel. Come to my channel. Always Briar's channel. That's part of our rules. <laughs> Become a part of Revolver Live by submitting your topics, your suggestions, your feedback, or your question of the week at revolvergamescast at gmail.com. That's revolvergamescast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you guys, and thank you so much for joining us once again. Yeah, we do want that feedback, guys. Make sure you bring it in. We really want to make that a big part of the show. And, I love it. Uh, do we want to do uh, viewer questions on next week's show or a viewer question? Yeah, viewer, I think the or, question of the week. Viewer I'd love no, to uh, hear. Yeah, yeah in the question, comments. Topic yeah. of the week. Uh, I'm going to float one out there and see if you guys agree. I think there's been a lot of uh, hype in the chat around this Apple versus the world or Apple versus PC tool. I'd yeah. love to hear what everyone on this show thinks of Apple, Apple products. Uh, are Apple not going to go innovative? well for Apple. <laughs> I don't know. We might have a load of pretentious hipster, you know, hey, Starbucks hey, lurkers. Hey, hey, hey. We never know. <laughs> Look, Motherfucker. Yeah. At least, it's okay when you make least. fun of the console peasants, but hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what we, we just want to make sure that we know who we can ban in chat. So you make a positive comment about Apple and it's really easy to find you and kick you out of the community because we obviously don't want your type here. Noticed, Damn, I noticed that Gary. Apple didn't get behind the uh, two teraflops a month to help people out. I you don't know what teraflops are at Apple. Like, what is that? They're like, what the fuck are teraflops? <laughs> <laughs> Not a clue. They wear. Is that some other kind tera- of fruit we can name it after? They like, would definitely. They would definitely be on Microsoft side with the most beautiful pixels ever. <laughs> that's that's yeah, straight that's out of pixels. Apple handbook right there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He asked Apple go with Terraflop. Edges. <laughs> Not going to end well. No, I think if we have a, an Apple based discussion, any topic you want to bring, any comments you want to make about Apple products, Apple <laughs> hardware, Apple software, uh, we'd love to hear it in the comment section. Shout out to Inner Black Ninja, guys. Uh, we hope to have him on the show one day soon. And he said in the comments, fuck Apple. So I'm, I'm guessing it's becoming kind of ubiquitous in the comments. People are not also, having. No oh, more. All, any comment about Beastly's beard problem is going to get deleted. We're sick about hearing about it. He understands what the problem is, and he's aware. We're not going to deal with it in the comment section anymore. <laughs> True that. <laughs> well, we got, that. That's why we got that out there. And uh, talking about Apple and how much we hate them, um, if you are an Apple devotee, please find us on iTunes um, because <laughs> as much as we hate Apple – we will happily shamelessly abuse their platform for views. Um, this podcast is now found on Apple and Podbean. Type in Revolver Live. The um, audio version is mixed beautifully by myself. Um, you can hear all of our stunning voices in local quality recording, so you miss nothing. Um, and it will be out to you uh, sometime tomorrow evening UK time. So that will be lunchtime for all you stateside colonials. Um, so, yeah, look forward to... Catching you, uh, catching you then. Should we hit him oh, with the video Apple, at the end? But we love iTunes. <laughs> 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 fuck Apple, but we're cool with iTunes. We we and like got, what you're doing there. Oh, those Apple dollars somehow. Look at leave us reviews as well. In fact, if you leave a review and say fuck Apple in the review on iTunes, that will be pleasantly ironic. Should we play the video at the end of the show? <laughs>